We think structurally returns more broadly are going to be lower. We think that the global economy is in a relatively good shape and we expect to see a soft landing in the US, but we also now expect to see a relatively soft landing in Europe. The Fed is beginning to kind of adjust to the fact that the economy is weakened and that it views itself as being in restrictive territory. I think the market is probably severely underpricing what the Fed may say. I think they are likely to be more hawkish. The market is actually, in my view, underpricing the risk of heights for this year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. What a week coming up. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Bramford. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK back with us tomorrow. Equity futures down about eight-tenths of 1% on the S&P. The story of the year so far, though, an epic rally. The Nasdaq 100 up about 11%. The Euro stocks 50 up in Europe by 10%. Bramo, I guess the question for us this morning and most people on Wall Street, chase this rally or fade this rally going into the Fed on Wednesday? And you started it correctly, which is that this week is a monster week, potentially a pivot point as we get uh, not only word from the Federal Reserve on Wednesday, but also the ECB, the Bank of England on Thursday, and a slew of earnings that are really going to set up what the real read-through has been for the for the fourth quarter earnings season. The fade this rally seems to be the tone coming out of JP Morgan and Mislav Mateka this morning. They say Q1 will, in our view, likely mark a turn point. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley were still trying to get used to this on the same page as JP Morgan through 2023 so far saying this morning don't fight the Fed perhaps this week will serve as a reminder of that. On the flip side, you've got likes, the likes of uh, Stephen Major of HSBC coming out and saying typically markets rally the most when you are near the penultimate rate hike and that we look like uh, we might be approaching that level. So really a two-sided story at a time of incredible uncertainty and complete upheaval of last year's main thesis. I'll take your pick then. Central bank decisions, the earnings or the payrolls report on Friday. If you had to pick one right now, what would it be? Earnings. I think that earnings are going to be the key because nobody believes the Fed. That seems to be the takeaway. Don't fight the Fed. It's turned it to fight the Fed. Everybody's going to fight the Fed. They're just wrong. I mean, honestly, that's what the message has been from the market. Full coverage coming up on Wednesday of the Federal Reserve and that news conference right here on Bloomberg Surveillance. I am told TK will be back, especially for that. Futures right now, negative nine-tenths of 1% on the S&P. Check out the euro in the FX market. Earlier on this morning, Spanish CPI came in hot. German and GDP came in soft. The ECB set to go another 50 basis points on Thursday and euro dollar reclaimed to 109 handle. 109.07 right now, positive a third of 1%. Lisa, looking at yields higher by four basis points, your 10-year in at around 350 for the last couple of weeks. Right now, 354.58. And how much has that stability, that rally in the 10-year yield really underpinned some of the rally that we've seen in equities? Just to give you a sense of the week ahead, let's give you a real play-by-play. -play. On the central banking front, we have the FOMC rate decision on Wednesday. Bank of England and ECP rate decisions on Thursday. You've been asking all week, uh, last week, John, about who would go further, who would hike more this year. The ECB was the dominant consensus. How much does that get really ratified by what we see uh, in this week's decisions? On the earnings front, we talked about what's more important. We have uh, Thursday, we have Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet. Meta comes out on Wednesday. I am very curious about business spending. If you start to see business spending roll over, if you start to see the pain that we've seen in semiconductors, Conductors push into some of these tech stocks, how much does it undermine the rally? Look at that rally. It has been absolutely tremendous this year. So Apple far. up 12%, Meta up 26%, Alphabet up 12%, Amazon up 21%. It's pretty impressive stuff, isn't it? This is what's led. People were saying that tech wasn't going to lead. Then how do you explain this? And how much are you going to push back against that? And then on the data front, we get Wednesday jolts data, which I actually think is going to be really important. Thursday, non-farm uh, productivity as well as jobless claims. And on Friday, the January non-farm payrolls report. How low do these numbers have to go before we can talk about true weakness in a labor market that does not seem to be playing out in initial jobless claims and other peripheral uh, metrics? And, and to me, that could potentially change the narrative in a way that you're talking about. Do you remember the consensus coming into 23 as we wrap up the month? For January in a couple of days' time. It was um, dip and rip, wasn't it? Wasn't the first half meant to be the bad half and the second half was meant to be the better half? That, Have we switched that, no, that in the last couple of days? Okay, look, it's not the last couple of days. That ended about January 3rd, right? That was the rip and dip, though the dip and rip turned into the rip and dip uh, by the second week of January. And now we just seem to be perhaps the rip and never dip because it's over. Steve Chevron joins us now, the head of multi asset solutions at Federated Hermes. Steve, wonderful to catch up with you. Bearish for so yeah. long, Steve. If I asked you this question this morning, do you chase this rally or fake this rally? How do you answer it? Yeah, we got on the other side of it right at the beginning of the year. I, I think there are opportunities for this rally to go longer and higher than you would expect. I mean, you've got inflation that's likely to come down given the year-over-year -year comps. 
earnings season expectations were so poor. The market was looking for this kind of first half recession, but the labor market's going to take a much longer time to, to kind of decelerate. So, you know, we think that this strength can go higher. You traditionally have 15, 20 percent rallies when you have Fed pauses. Those are usually suckers rallies, usually. Um, and so I, I think it's premature to cancel the recession. I, I think there's so many signs that the economy is likely to head into recession, but it's going to take a while. And that's been the hallmark of this whole cycle. Every stage has taken longer and gone farther than you expect. We think this rally could last us through mid-year, uh, but ultimately we still do have those concerns about recession. We just think that's a kind of second half story. And in the meantime, you've got to play this. So, Steve, talk to me about how you're playing. Is it through international? Is it through U.S. tech? A combination of both? It's exactly what we did. We didn't want to jump on the tech train at the beginning of the year. We think earnings there are still vulnerable. We think valuations are still very much too expensive. We get that they are going to run on this kind of rally, but we decided to do it internationally. We did it both in developed and EM International. But again, this is a rally that we're dating. It's not necessarily one that we're marrying, at least not yet. So how do you know that the date's over and to break up? you got to keep following the fundamental the fundamentals. If, if it turns out that the market is moving higher and we're in the mid, you know, 4,000s, let's say, by mid-year, yet earnings are still coming down, yield curves are still inverted, the labor market is continuing to slow. You know, people look at this and, and they're confounded by the labor market. Unemployment doesn't rise before a recession. It rises in one. And in fact, it takes usually six months to go from the low in unemployment, which we just hit, to the start of a recession, over which time the unemployment rate really barely rises, maybe by two-tenths of a percent. And so I think you have to look at those emerging layoff announcements, see if the labor market continues to weaken. And if it does, uh, you're going to need to fade this. When you go into if emerging, it doesn't, yeah. it's a different story. But when, yeah. you, when you go into emerging markets, Steve, how much is this really a story about China and the reopening there, just entirely riding that until we get more concrete data on just the contours of what that looks like? I mean, it's certainly a big part of it, but it's not its not the entirety of it. I, I'd say the other key factors here, you know, you do have a Fed that's likely to pause. Emerging markets in general tend to do better when the Fed's not hiking. You've got a dollar that's weakening, and I think it may weaken, right? Well, you were just talking about maybe the ECB is going to be a little bit more aggressive than the Fed this year in terms of rate hikes. You'd have to expect at some point Japan might have to abandon yield curve controls. And so you may have this scenario where a weaker dollar – no more rate hikes plus a China reopening gives you, you know, a decent window here. The stocks are certainly reacting to that. Steve, let's get to the Fed on Wednesday. If I was in that news yeah. conference and I was a journalist, this is the question I would ask. Do you believe we've seen an unwarranted easing of financial conditions? Very simple. Let's see how he answers it. How do you think he will approach that question? Because it's very likely to be asked. I mean, I think he, he, they've got to be frustrated, John. I mean, if you look relative to a year ago, not, not necessarily the peaks mid-year, but one full year ago, the labor market's incrementally hotter than it was 12 months ago. Inflation is as hot, if not as hot, as it was 12 months ago. Now, it's, it's coming down, so I don't, I don't want to discount that. But financial conditions are much looser. Um, and they've spent so much political capital trying to defend this median dot, you would think that they, they're, they're going to have to see it through. I, I don't think that you're going to have a recession or not because of you know an extra 25 basis points. So my guess is if they go to 25 here, they might do two more 25s to at least get to that median dot. And I would expect that he would push back against these financial conditions some. That being said, I have not had the best luck at predicting what Powell's going to say. I've had a much better job predicting what he's going to do. Um, so we'll see. You know, I'll be watching along with you and, and we'll see how he responds. But you know he's going to get that question. Steve, can you pair that idea with your bullishness right now, the riding of the rally? Why is it not going to be successful if the Fed does try to jawbone down this market? Why? Well, because I, I think that the data is going to look encouraging, and the data on the road to a soft landing doesn't look very different than the data on the road to recession, right? Re inflation is going to come down. You know, earnings are going to come down. You would expect that in a soft landing, but maybe not catastrophically. You expect the labor market to slow. And so you've had a market that for you know, the better part of a year has wanted to rally on any sign of good news. I think they're going to get data that, that can be construed that way. Um, ultimately, I think that is on the road to recession. It would be a historical anomaly to have this much of the yield curve inverted. And I, mean, I could go through all the various different statistics and not have a recession. But if you go back every cycle, the market has a big hurrah rally like that. It did it in 19. It did it in 2006. And so I, I, I think that that's, those are the powerful forces. The market's going to see what they want in this Rorschach test. 
And there's been a bullish lean for the last year. Uh, and usually the last one's the biggest one. And I think that's you know, at least what we're in. It can last six months, it could be 20%. And so, you know, if you're a long-term investor, you might be able to ignore that. But if you're trying to manage, you know, through the markets as, as, as our charge, I think you got to be cognizant of that risk right now. Well, it's lasted four weeks so far this year in 23. Steve, great to catch up, buddy. As always, Steve Chevron there a Federated Hermes, getting you set up for the Federal Reserve this coming Wednesday. The Federal Reserve decision and news conference with Chair Powell, even at this point, if you could guess what Chairman Powell was going to say, could you guess how the market would respond to it? Because over the last few months, Bramo, you just get the feeling the market participants, one by one, have turned on, I don't know, deaf ears to what Fed participants, Fed officials are telling them about what they want to do with Fed funds. Well, you just heard Steve right there. He's bullish. He thinks you should ride this rally, and he thinks that Fed officials are going to push back. The implication is perhaps that people are going to shrug off whatever they say. It's just jawboning. Again, the don't fight the Fed has turned into fight the Fed with everything you've got because they're wrong, and that suddenly seems to be the mantra across markets. JP Morgan fighting this move. Miss Love Bataker, here's the full quote for you. Confirmation for the next leg higher might not come. Instead, markets could encounter an air pocket of weaker earnings and activity as they move through Q2 and Q3. Are we pushing this out? Is that what we're doing here? Are we pushing the bearishness out? Okay, the earnings haven't been great. So people are saying, yes, you know, when the earnings start getting worse, they're not great. You see a lot of weakness, uh, pockets of real trouble. So at what point are they bad enough on some sort of holistic level versus this rolling recession that we see during different industries? At what point does it start to get people's attention? Or is it really, as Steve was saying, people want to rally, so they're going to find a reason. They're going to find the silver linings in the Rorschach test. What's your big question for Chairman Powell Wednesday? My big question really is how much are they going to push back against market conditions? And can they do it in a material way by, you know, say, raising rates by 50 basis points? I know Mohammed Alarian was suggesting that that last week in a column that you know maybe they should shock the markets and he's not alone in thinking that it should versus will yeah, maybe yeah, they should so. do you think they will <laughs> well no but i wonder what leo brainard if she actually does leave the fed i wonder if that changes some of the feeling there It'll be an interesting conversation in the next couple of months coming up on this program ken drop in there the founder and chairman of graham capital looking forward to that conversation in about an hour from now equity futures as we kick off the trading week down and hard, actually, by 8 or 9 tenths of 1% on the S&P. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Iran, authorities say that a drone attack caused a heavy explosion at a defense ministry ammunition depot. The attack happened in the city of Isfahan. According to the Wall Street Journal, Israel carried out that strike. The journal says the aim was to look for new ways to contain Tehran's nuclear and military ambitions. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will try to get back on track today with a plan to overhaul the struggling National Health Service. Sunak's blueprint includes more ambulances, more hospital beds and longer hours for urgent care centers. Over the weekend, Sunak fired Conservative Party Chairman Nadim Zahawi over his tax affairs following weeks of damaging headlines. The Federal Reserve set to shrink interest rate hikes again this week. Policymakers are likely to raise their benchmark federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point on Wednesday. And that would follow recent data suggesting the Fed's aggressive campaign to slow infl inflation is working. The European Central Bank's first interest rate decision of 2023 is still just days away. But the focus has already shifted to what will happen after that. A half point hike is all but guaranteed on Thursday. The question is whether policymakers plan to repeat that move in March or open the door to a smaller increase. And it will be the Kansas City Chiefs versus the Philadelphia Eagles in the Super Bowl. The Chiefs beat Cincinnati 23-20 with a last-second field goal to win the AFC Championship. Meanwhile, the Eagles, they pounded San Francisco 31-7 in the NFC title game. The Super Bowl set for February 12th in Glendale, Arizona. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I know the president said he didn't want to have any discussions, but I think it's very important that our whole government is designed to find compromise. I want to find a reasonable and a responsible uh, way that we can lift the debt ceiling but take control of this runaway spending. We haven't been in this place to debt since World War II, so we can't continue down this path. 
Speaker of the House there, Kevin McCarthy, speaking on CBS over the weekend. Live from New York, good morning to you. Big week ahead. Let's give you a flavour, a snapshot of the price action this morning in equities. On the S&P 500, futures down nine-tenths of 1%. Tough time for Chinese tech. We'll pick up on that story a little bit later after a phenomenal time for Chinese tech over the last three months. In the bond market, yields higher going into the Fed on Wednesday. Payrolls on Friday, 354.40 on a US 10-year. That's your yield. Crude not doing much. Euro dollar doing something. 109.07, that currency pair positive by a third of 1%. A little bit earlier this morning, Spanish CPI came in hot. German GDP came in soft. We're looking for the ECB to go 50 basis points at this meeting this week on Thursday and maybe again at the meeting after that and perhaps even again in the meeting after that. Some pushback this morning from Mislav Matejka of JP Morgan, Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley, Max Kettner of HSBC publishing just minutes ago and Max had this to say. Hawkish surprises could upset some of the bullish repricing. It won't take much to prompt a short-term setback for risk assets. He's talking about central bank decisions this week, particularly the Federal Reserve on Wednesday. But he said this to follow up. This won't change our first half view. In fact, we'd rather increase exposure to risk assets during such setbacks. Now, let me be clear about Max. We came into this year, the consensus view was first half tough, second half better. Max Kentner of HSBC flipped that quite early on in the year. Brammer, who looked for a better first half and maybe a tougher second half. Which is what it seems like everybody did. And well, price action will make you change your mind quickly, right? Well, it's price action, but it's also the fact that the data shows a real real deceleration in the inflation in the U.S. Perhaps we're past peak inflation. And that's the reason why people are not buying the fact that the Fed is going to go as far as they say. They keep pushing back. And that's the reason why perhaps jawboning can work for a week, but not longer than that. Does the debt ceiling conversation change that? <laughs> Isn't that the most frustrating conversation of the moment? Every I time I bring it up with a guest, we do a segment, we set it up. The producers on the 9 o'clock oh, do yeah. a great job of just coming up with the sound, all the quotes, all of that good stuff. Then I go to the guests, and the guests just go, no. What? <laughs> just stop. I've, I've got nothing this? to say. Well, I've got nothing to say. You know, and this is the issue, because especially with politicians knowing what a political liability it will be, if they do somehow end up in a 2011 type of scenario, it's one reason why people push back against this. It will get taken care of. It just will be kind of messy. At the same time, you do wonder over the longer term whether there does, you know have some you know, longer-term price action. What's well, different this time? It's, it's exhausting. This is so exhausting. You can say Why it if you want. Reasons to think it's different this time? Well, it's reasons to think that maybe it has a longer-lasting kind of, you know, premium on debt sure. that you have to pay out and people look at the political instability and, you know. The problem is, is that it's like this everywhere in the world. It is. So how are you going to deal with this in a sort of a vacuum if you also have strikes everywhere and complete uh, internecine battles in every other democratic nation? Anne-Marie joins us down in Washington, D.C., a Washington correspondent. AMH, let's start there. Any news on this? Any chance that we just kind of kick the can further down the road? Well, it does seem like... At least the talks right now look like they're in a slow motion, right? We finally have a date, though, Jonathan, when President Biden will be sitting down with Speaker McCarthy. Obviously, the debt ceiling, top of that agenda, uh, Speaker McCarthy does say, and he said this weekend on Face the Nation, that he thinks he can come to a reasonable agreement with the president. But so far, with these battle lines that are drawn between the Republicans and the Democrats about raising the debt ceiling, getting and the Republicans wanting an extraction of fe federal spending for that— there's been no movement. Uh, one thing McCarthy did say over the weekend is that Social Security and Medicare should be off the table. Doesn't mean he has the, potentially the votes for that. But he said all discretional spending, including defense spending, on the table. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what comes out of this meeting, and that's taking place on Wednesday. And marie just, you know, I have to ask, do you think Kevin McCarthy regrets taking this job? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think this is something he's wanted for a very long time. And the fact that he was able to last, what was it, 15 votes and, and still continued uh, to want this job, I think knowing the individuals, uh, the personalities he was uh, getting on board with, uh, he's prepared for it. But I do think he knows that he is walking a very th um, tight rope, right, between the extremes almost of his conference. So given the fact that he is walking a tightrope, what would be the purpose at this moment to visit Taiwan, to go over to uh, the, the island that has caused so much uh, controversy over in the South Asian Sea? Well, he said in the past when Speaker Pelosi went last year that this is a trip he'd like to do if he was Speaker, preparing for you know his his uh, his leadership in that role. We don't know yet on any fixed dates. He has said he wanted to go. Punchbowl News is reporting that there are talks of of a trip in place. Um, this would be about 
the Republicans, as, as the Democrats have had, making sure that they are standing up for Taiwan and also showing that they are not just talking tough, but almost walking the walk when it comes to um, making sure they are combating China and China's, what many perceive, is, gro is growing threats. It's an interesting moment and time for it because obviously you have the Biden administration trying to warm some relations with China and get some conversations and dialogue back on track. And Secretary Blinken will be headed there as well in early February. Uh, so this will only draw the ear of China, which we've already seen from the Beijing Foreign Ministry this morning talking talking about this to reporters. Amory, can we set up the conversation for the next hour? We'll have a longer conversation on this, but I just wanted to tear it up with you. The race for 2024, the former president, Donald Trump, over the weekend. This line jumped out to me. I'm more angry now. I'm more committed now than I ever was. There's been a lot of questions about his campaign or lack thereof. AMH, I thought we'd be hitting the ground running talking about the current president making another run at this, and we haven't had the official announcement there either. Now, mm -hmm. Document Gate seems to have taken over completely in Washington. Where are we on the race for 24? Well, so far, we only have one candidate running. And as you mentioned, that's former President Trump. Two really important states he visited this weekend, South Carolina and New Hampshire. Um, it does seem that his campaign has lost some of the momentum um, and heart, as Governor Sununu put it over the weekend at CNN, that you saw that fight he had in 2016. We are still waiting um, from an announcement from the current president, Biden, on whether or not he's going to run for 2024. But, Jonathan, all the conversations, direction does look like he will get in that race. But it's still very early on, especially on the Republican side. And if you look at all the polls, a lot of them have been conducted over the past week or so. It does show that uh, Governor DeSantis has a much better chance, an opportunity to win, uh, than if it was to be the former President Trump. What did you make of the comments from Nikki Haley? the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Ambery. What did you make of that? Well, she didn't show up in South Carolina, right? She was supposed to be there alongside the likes of Senator Graham to talk about these are his allies when it comes to this campaign. And she decided to not go because she said originally she would not get in the race if the former president was running Trump. And it does look like she is now potentially going to throw her hat in the ring. Time for a new generation, Bramo. How did you respond to that? Adding, can I be that leader? Yes, I think I can be that leader. So a new that's generation, so that's me. That's what you I said. You said Mike Pompeo recently as well. <laughs> Absolutely shredded. Absolutely shredded. If that's a man that's preparing for a run, I think that's a man preparing for a run. Are you looking for diet tips? No, like seriously, for, for what, what kind looking of looking absolutely fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Seriously. So what do you think he lifts? I've got no idea. I wouldn't <laughs> possibly like, comment. If he wants to come on and talk about any of that stuff, we can talk about politics first and then get to that. But he looks brilliant. Nikki <laughs> Haley seems to be throwing her name into the hat as well. This could be a really competitive race for that party. Which raises this issue of well, what does the Democratic Party do on the other side? Because perhaps uh, President Biden could win against the former President Trump. But what about some of these others if they were to win the nomination? AMH, looking forward to this conversation in the next hour. Anne Marie's going to drop by again. In just a moment, Bruce Kasman, Chief Economist over at JP Morgan, is going to join us too. It's not just payrolls this week, it's the ISM and the PMIs, the S&P Global PMI, sub 50 for how long? I think you've got to go all the way back to August. Well, yeah. Are you more interested in the manufacturing or the services I ISM? Oh, I think if we can get both, great. That's and a, we do get that's both. That's a good point. I no, know. I, I'm, I'm totally personally agree. More manufacturing is very services. clear. Yeah. Manufacturing is exactly. weak, without a doubt. Does it spread to services? That's what I want to say. Do claims start to tick higher? It'll because be data point of the week last week was claims. We're going to get both the uh, non-farm payrolls and then we're going to get those ISM prints. And that's what I'm going to be really focused on, the services side of that. What a busy week. Futures down 1%. This is Bloomberg. Going into the Federal Reserve later this week, equities down, down hard on the S&P after a massive run year today over the last four weeks. On the S&P right now, we're negative one full percentage point on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, quite a run year to date. The Nasdaq 100 up 11% coming into Monday. Futures now down by 1.3%. Plenty of bearish talk from Mislav Mateka at JP Morgan. From Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley this morning, don't fight the Fed. Perhaps this week will serve as a reminder. Going into the Fed decision, yields look like this. Twos, tens and thirties. On a two-year at the moment, 423.41. Yield time by three or four basis points. On a 10-year, up by four basis points to 354.58. 
We heard from Lisa a little bit earlier this morning mentioning the latest letter from Steve Major, his newsletter over at HSBC, who said for bond investors to buy cheaply, they need to start doing so near the top of the rate cycle on just about every penultimate rate hike in the US. It would have been a good decision to buy. The question is whether you think this hike coming this week is the penultimate rate hike. And we could talk about that with Mike McKee in just a moment. I want to finish on foreign exchange. Euro dollar shaping up as follows. Stronger euro today. Weaker dollar. Euro dollar 109, just about. 108.99. Earlier on this morning, Spanish CPI came in hot. We'll get CPI from France, Germany, Italy over the next couple of days. But CPI hot. And German GDP came in soft going into Thursday. The ECB looking for another 50 basis point move. We get a slow of eco data this week. We get the Fed decision on Wednesday. The Bank of England, the ECB on Thursday. And finally, the US payrolls report to round out the week. And Mike McKee jumping in the chair. Mike McKee, what a week coming up. It's totally unfair that they do this because they could spread I agree. it out and we I have agree. much more fun. we got to get it all in one <laughs> it's week. All about us. And we're going to have a lot of interest rate moves, basically, is what we know. Because the Fed will go at least 25 and the ECB and the Bank of England could go 50. And then the question is, what do they say about it all? I mean, I assume that Christine Lagarde is going to say we're not done because they've got a bigger problem than we do. But could Jay Powell say we're close to the end now. Uh, we might do one more or we'll see what the data tell us. We'll have two jobs reports, two CPIs before the next Fed meeting in March. And so there could be data that say you don't move. Uh, does Powell want to upset the markets? I mean, you, get, you got the yields going in the right direction today for the Fed. Tighten things up a little bit. Does he want to really uh, okay. surprise people? Going in the right direction marginally by a couple of basis points after fluctuating around the same level for uh, you know about a month now. At what point do they get concerned about the easing of financial conditions, or do they not really care because the data is moving in their direction? I think they're probably closer to not really caring because the data is moving in their direction. It's hard to know exactly what it would take to get uh, financial conditions tighter. Uh, maybe if Powell came out and said we're going to go to six percent or something like that. But at, at this point, you've got. 450 basis points, another 25 coming, and we're still seeing positive financial conditions. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you're right, data's going in the Fed's direction. So, well, you know, why mess with a good thing? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as the man said. And Mike, end of August, you were there with us, Jackson Hill, Wyoming. That very short, blunt speech. How long was it? Eight minutes, Lisa? Eight minutes. Eight minutes long, and that word pain came up in that speech. He said, while higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labour market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. I'm looking at jobless claims and just ask it, <laughs> where's the pain that he was talking about yeah. five months ago? Well, it's starting to come. You're starting to see a lot more layoff announcements spread outside of tech. It just takes a while for all of that to hit uh, the data. But the, so far, what we're seeing is basically companies rationalizing their workforces rather than reducing their workforces. If you can uh, parse that distinction there, uh, we're not seeing mass layoffs because business is bad. What we seem to be seeing is layoffs as companies restructure to look to more profitable areas. They're not trying to get rid of a lot of people because they had such a hard time finding them after the pandemic. You down in Washington Wednesday? Be down in Washington Wednesday and uh, try to keep you informed on what's going on. Looking forward to it, Mike. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Mike McKee there on the latest. Mike's going to be down in Washington on Wednesday in that news conference with questions for Chairman Powell, no doubt. Joining us now is Bruce Kasman, Chief Economist and Global Head over at Economic Research in J.P. Morgan's house. So let's talk about the house view over at J.P. Morgan, Bruce. Can we talk about where you see this Fed going? And when Steve Major of HSBC talks about the penultimate hike, is this hike this Wednesday the penultimate hike of this cycle? Well, we as most people think the Fed's going to go 25, and I think it's going to be a Fed that continues to talk about the need to do more. However, I do think as the data is showing a moderation in inflation and some cooling in labor demand, I think the Fed's getting more comfortable and probably will hint a bit at uh, getting closer to a pause. I think we should recognize, though, that the pause is not going to be because the job is complete. It's going to be because the Fed is hopeful that the lags in the monetary transmission uh, mechanism will deliver its results. So thinking about whether the pause is actually the last um, um, you know, tightening by the Fed, I think you have to ask yourself, where's the economy going to be six or nine months? And we're not as comfortable as I think the market is uh, that the Fed is done here, that they will get inflation under control, uh, that we will have a recession, that all the dynamics that are going to keep the Fed on hold and maybe ease are going to be uh, realized. Bruce, just to get in the ways just a little bit, we won't get the projections on Wednesday. We will have a statement. There is this line in the statement that says ongoing increases. Do you think that line sticks on Wednesday? Um, I think it's a close call. If they're going to shift it, they'll probably shift it to something like further, which will be 
kind of diminishing the magnitude of what they're talking about, but not losing sight of the fact that they have uh, more work to do. Uh, but again, I think they want to be hawkish here. As you mentioned, there is an easing in financial conditions that they're at least somewhat concerned about. They don't have to tell us uh, that they're going to pause if a pause is going to happen after the March meeting, which really means leading into the May meeting, they may not move. There's a lot of time, a lot of data. They don't want to um, you know, validate significant further easing in financial conditions. But I think they're getting closer to a resting point, a resting point that's based on hope that the lags and transmission mechanism will deliver more, because we're certainly not where the Fed needs to be in terms of its objectives. Bruce, you push back against this idea of the immaculate disinflation, that there would be this ongoing decline in inflation that could even get us back to 2% by the end of this year. What would be the driver of that renewed inflationary aspect in markets? Well, it's not so much a renewed inflationary aspect. It's just that the disinflation we're seeing right now, which is largely an unwind of supply shocks and uh, and some other forces around weak goods demand that we've seen, that that's going to be provide. It's going to be there's going to be a cushion to that. There's going to be a limit to that in a world in which labor markets are tight, labor costs are still rising rapidly, and inflation psychology has shifted. So we think inflation will come down into the low uh, to mid threes, but I think it's going to be hard to get it down to the low to mid twos uh, without a much easier labor market. How do you understand this idea that we're not seeing a real uh, loosening in the labor market, that that tightness seems to be pervading all of the reports, even as we hear increasing anecdotes, not just in big tech, but even at smaller companies of layoffs and other cutbacks? So I think the tech story is somewhat specific. Tech was a high flyer and is now coming down to earth. I do think what you're seeing in the data is a bending in business behavior in the face of what has been weak demand and tightening financial conditions from the Fed move. You see the hours works numbers having cooled quite a bit. But I think businesses are very healthy. They've had excess demand for labor for some time. Uh, they're not going to start shedding labor pretty uh, rapidly here. So if we're right and what happens in the next few months is the tightening in financial conditions that we've had from the Fed continues to work, but it's being offset by fading supply shocks, a pickup in China and Europe, um, the dynamics of a healthy household sector that responds to that. And I think this week's auto sales number is going to be interesting in that regard. Um, I think what you're going to see is a, is a labor market that stays tight, and you're going to see labor demand that holds up, uh, and for fundamentally good reasons. So, Bruce, let's just put some numbers on things just briefly. Where do you see Fed funds ending up? Well, we have the Fed pausing at five after a March move, but we're kind of pretty even in our own th forecasting of scenarios of whether that's going to be the end or the Fed's going to have to sometime in the second half of the year uh, think about raising rates again. And I think that scenario is the one we want to consider, partly because the market is so far off of that in its pricing right now. So, Bruce, that's going to bring potentially a lot of volatility, if that is the case. You mentioned China as well. Can you tell me how China's reopening maybe influences the way you think about some of these issues? Well, I don't think China influences the big call right now, which is how much softening we see in the U.S. corporate sector as it's turning into the new year. That we have to be broadly right, that that bending but not breaking is taking place. But if we're sitting here in three, four months and the U.S. Uh, corporate sector hasn't broken, if the benefits of lower inflation is helping consumers, then the China reopening, which we think is largely going to be a demand impulse, is going to have an impact on commodity prices, is going to have an impact on goods prices globally, and it's going to add a reflationary impulse uh, to the U.S. as well as the global economy. Bruce, you talk about how perhaps we're not going to get a recession this year. Is that a recession deferred that's going to mean that the recession that comes, say, in 2024 is going to be worse? Or is it just pushing it out, lengthening the timeline in a cycle that people thought was moving a little faster than it is? So we don't think we're going into recession now, but I think the risks of going into recession uh, later this year or in 2024 are quite high. And I think part of it is simply there are still lags in the transmission mechanism. But the bigger issue here is if we are in a situation uh, where inflation is sticky, labor costs particularly are sticky, um, and the environment remains one where the Fed has to stay higher or higher, that I think gradually you're going to build the vulnerabilities that could cause a recession. And I think the point to make there is that while uh, we tend to think that this recession is going to be mild, and it will be mild when you look at the GFC event, which was off the charts, uh, if we have a recession in late 23 into 24, and it's coming with synchronized monetary tightening that's resuming around the world, uh, I think it's hard to see that as being a mild recession uh, in overall overall sense. And I'd push back against the idea that recession that's going to come here is going to be mild uh, by any by any circumstances. Bruce, this was deeply thoughtful stuff. 
and we appreciate your time, sir. Bruce Kasman there of JP Morgan. Bruce Kasman there, not constructive on the outcome for this economy down the road. Not down the road. Sort of the near-term constructiveness leading to longer-term, more difficult period. I mean, this to me is sort of the interesting dynamic of people who are pushing out their forecasts. It might mean more pain later because, as Bruce was talking about, the synchronization of tightening as well as a recession, as well as a downturn with the vulnerabilities that have built up over a year. The resiliency of this labour market, front and centre in this conversation. Andrew Hollenhorst, The City, publishing just moments ago. So many people publishing this morning to kick off a really busy week. Andrew had this to say. We expect upcoming stronger core inflation to challenge this most recent version of the transitory inflation narrative that's the latest from city yeah they've been they've been talking about this for a while they think that inflation isn't going to roll over so quickly and so then you go into the distinction between uh, sort of the deceleration in inflation that was expected and when is it enough to be continued to sort of uh, have the sustained momentum to go beyond three percent two and a half percent or closer to two percent and does it matter is the fed going to really uh, double down to get to that two percent if you do start seeing more pain and i'm guilty of saying this every single monday but what a week coming up. <laughs> there have been a couple Mondays we haven't you, said that. You could probably cut that and just play it out every Monday <laughs> well, I think for me that just saying, no, what a week. This is an important coming up. week. This is a Last week was a bit of a snoozer. This week's a, an <laughs> important that, week. Is that what you meant? It was London. a bit of a snoozer. <laughs> You're like, you know, it's all about you, London. I was going to be here. A bit of a snoozer. Yeah, you know, it you wasn't know, that's why I was snoozer. absent. Yeah, just yeah, total it wasn't, snooze. It wasn't that snooze. Futures on the S&P <laughs> down 1% <laughs> on the S&P 500. Yields a little bit higher. Euro dollar close to 109. In the next hour, Jordan Rochester of Nomura on the ECB and this FX market. Looking forward to that conversation shortly. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden will meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy Wednesday to discuss raising the debt ceiling and avoiding a U.S. default. Republicans want a deal that includes government spending costs. The president has refused to negotiate over the debt limit. In Germany, the economy shrank two-tenths of one percent at the end of last year. And that was worse than expected. And it makes a recession more likely after all. Soaring inflation, in part due to higher energy bills, has weighed on German household spending. Billionaire Gota Madani attempt to restore confidence in his business empire is falling flat with investors. Shares of most Adani Group firms slumped again today. The sell-off has now erased about $68 billion in market value. Over the weekend, Adani issued a 413-page rebuttal to allegations of fraud by short seller Hindenburg Research. Job cuts are on the way at Royal Phillips. The Dutch maker of medical equipment is cutting 6,000 positions. That's about 8% of its workforce. That comes on top of 4,000 job cuts that were announced last year. Phillips is reducing expenses while dealing with costly recalls of some of its consumer products. And Renault and Nissan have agreed to reorganize their more than two-decade-old alliance. The partners will each retain a 15% cross shareholding, with Renault transferring the remainder of its stake into a French trust for a coordinated sale. The deal still needs approval from the company's boards. The Japanese automaker will also invest in Renault's electric vehicle and software business, Ampere. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We think that the global economy is in a relatively good shape and we expect to see a soft landing in the US but we also now expect to see a relatively soft landing in Europe. The falls in gas prices have helped the pick up in China as well but the absence of recession as you say doesn't mean we're yet into a strong recovery cycle. Fantastic to catch up with Peter Oppenheimer there, Goldman Sachs' chief global equity strategist over in London just last week. There is, of course, a difference between recession and stagnation, but there is, also, of course, a difference of stagnation and recovery. And I think getting excited about stagnation, Bramo, I find slightly difficult. Well, less disappointed about a stagnation than okay. a right recession. Perhaps this is the really the issue that you were asking a lot of people. Are we just seeing people just close out shorts? Or are people actually getting along? And that's really underpinning some of the questions. Although, if you could check out the U.S. and international investors, it's getting long. Europe and it's getting long EM. I keep hearing these stories, reading these stories, these headlines. How can you get long the reopening story? And I'm sitting here like it's been going on for three months over in China. I looked at Alibaba on the charts last night, 87% higher from the October lows 
in three months. Lisa, I think another question you could ask is not where do I want to be for the reopening? Have we seen the reopening trade already take place in the last three months? It's a great point, especially as people start talking about everything that's going to end up happening. There was one interview with Boeing's CEO basically saying that air travel is going to return to about 90% of pre-COVID levels because of China's reopening, boosting it uh, really substantially. Have we seen that fully played out in the shares? I think Guy's going to catch up with Boeing later this week, isn't he? I think Guy so. Johnson. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Then he's dropping by New York, you know. Couple of days. Guy or Guy. The Boeing? CEO? Not the Boeing CEO. I care more about <laughs> You care more Guy's about Guy. Than that would be wonderful. I'd Boeing love to CEO. catch up with Guy. We can talk to Guy about Europe. We're going to talk to Maria today about Europe right now. Maria, great to catch up with you as always. Spanish CPI comes in hot, German GDP comes in soft. What's more important for the ECB this Thursday? Uh, look at this point, and it's not because I'm Spanish. By the way, I, I used to be the Spanish eco-reporter. This is a data point that I cover religiously for almost two years of my life, but it's not a bias. It's just this is a single mandate central bank, and obviously it's about inflation. If you look at the data coming out of Spain today, inflation accelerating 5.8% in January. We're expecting a cool down. We got the opposite. When you look at core inflation, also sticky. I should note, however, and this is very important, uh, when you look at Spain, which a lot of people in the market look as a forward-looking indicator for the rest of the euro area, is that core inflation gets measured differently uh, in Spain. But to answer your question, at this point, it really is inflation. If you look at everything that Madame Lagarde has said for the past, well, four weeks, is that it's all about inflation. The ECB has a job, and that is to bring it down to target. Maria, you follow the commentary from ECB officials far more closely than I do these days. Can you tell me how much division is there on the government? in council. Look, I think the, the thing that to me is very striking is that she came out very hard in December. You remember that press conference. She said the job is not done. We have to get inflation back to target. This is not hit and remove. This will be hit and stay the course. And there has been very little pushback from the doves. You've not really heard a lot on that. I think when you look at Thursday, and that is, of course, a big meeting. The market is expecting another 50 basis points hike. The real question will be, will she signal another 50 basis points? come March. If you look at the data out of Spain today, you could argue the Hawks have it. They have an argument to say we have to continue to hike around 50 basis points. To build, though, on what John was asking about, Germany looks like it's poised for a recession. So even though you are seeing optimism in Spain and some of the other economies, the biggest one of the euro region is struggling. Does that color the conversation at all and sort of temper how much the ECB will go? And look, that's a very good point, because sometimes we talk about this European recession. And European recession, do you mean Germany or do you mean the entire euro area? If you look at countries like Spain, Italy, France, there is no signal of recession. Basically, the economy is not in a recession, but Germany is obviously the biggest one. If you look at German policymakers, what they'll tell you, however, is that this recession will be shallow, will be short, and their own focus is on inflation. You look at the German central bank, they continue to bang on around inflation. So really, I know that that this may seem a binary conversation as a growth, as an inflation, but at this time around, to me, it really seems, come Thursday again on the bigger picture, it really is about bringing down inflation to target, respective or regardless of what the economy is doing. Just to dig in a little bit more, how much of the increase in inflation that was unexpected in Spain had to do with fuel costs as well as tourism? I mean, there's just a weaker euro and people coming in and flooding the region with money. Look, I think that's a good point, too, when you look at the, the tourist uh, season. Of course, you have the big China reopening. We know that countries like France, like Italy, like uh, Spain, too, are big hubs for Chinese tourism. You have two big events happening in Q1, which are, of course, Fashion Week and uh, Carnival. I wish I had time for both. I have time for neither. But nonetheless, <laughs> that could play into this. But it's still too early to say whether that had an impact. You also had a number of national measures that came off uh, by the Spanish government at the end of December, a, a subsidy on fuel. Again, this was a flash reading, so I want to see the details at the end of the month when we get the confirmation. But I would still stress this point. Car inflation also includes some elements of food in Spain, so you have to treat it differently. Lisa, it was amazing going through these conversations last week and all this, let's call it, relatively speaking, constructive optimism around the European story, avoiding recession, and then reading the front pages of the European papers about the war taking place in Ukraine. It's almost like on Wall Street and in financial markets there is some kind of fatigue when a story goes on for too long. It's still happening. 
in Ukraine. And some people might argue, based on the events of the last week or so, things are escalating. I would agree with that. A lot of people are very concerned about trying to uh, get ahead, the offensive by Russia to get ahead of some of the weaponry that Ukraine's going to get from both Germany and the U.S. What that means, you have Olaf Scholz making noise of potentially trying to have some discussion with Vladimir Putin because this is dragging on and the deaths are just catastrophic. Maria, can we come to you on that? What is the latest on that front? People are very constructive, relatively speaking, about what's happening with the economy. Can you say the same thing about the war in Ukraine right now? Well, uh, Jonathan, if you look at the words of President Zelensky yesterday, uh, the, he, he's painting a, a, a grim picture. He says Russia is uh, willing or potentially preparing a new offensive. Remember, it's it's coming, that, that one-year mark of the invasion of Ukraine, uh, potentially something uh, to show to the Russian people may have to come. And yesterday he sounded, well, he sounded worried. He said we need more, not just weapons. Of course, he has the tanks, but we need more. He also obviously talks about the fighter jets. He says the war is going on. It has not gone away and time again could play into Russians hands he repeated yesterday so many times in that speech that he publishes pretty much every night we need we need this stuff now it really is about the speed now and who gets the upper hand Maria this was great as always thanks for your time Rita today there of Bloomberg over in Brussels on CPI the ECB a war in Ukraine and apparently on on fashion week as well and what else well, was it? Carnival? Yeah, I don't want to put those things all together, but I do think that there is this issue that you raised, and I think it's an important one. The geopolitical risks that people aren't talking about, perhaps because there's fatigue. And you talk about this war that continues to escalate on some levels, and you talk about sort of a widening question of the geopolitical arrangement with Russia's uh, support of Iran, the recent attacks of Iran, what that could mean for oil. I mean, if you look at some of the peripheral discussions and you talk with certain macro uh, traders, they're focused much more on this than it might seem. For Europe specifically, the overwhelming consensus is the ECB hikes more than the Federal Reserve this year. I went back to my comments, the uh, notes I made for ECB President Christine Lagarde in the meeting in December. We're not pivoting. We're not wavering. We have more ground to cover. We have longer to go. We're in it for the long game. Right. She's just going to repeat those comments all over again at this meeting. They have more oxygen, though, than the Fed because they're at less lofty levels, right? So then there's a question, is the euro region uh, going to function well with, say, a 3.5% overnight rate versus the 5% overnight rate that will be the peak for the Fed, right? So in other words, where is their limit? And is it a lot lower than the Fed, but they might hike more because they're further away from it this never year? Never mind 350. I never saw them getting to 250. <laughs> no way. Well, no right way. Now. Even 12 months ago, you said 250. I'd have just laughed. The ECB hiking interest rates, I would have laughed at that. The ECB getting to 250, I would have laughed at that too. The fact that there's been uh, an ongoing sustained recovery, or at least not a full out recession, in the face of two year German yields at 2.6% is really pretty incredible, I got to be honest. And maybe the inflation backdrop in Europe being stickier than some people think relative to the United States. We want to all put this in one bucket and maybe just say the ECB is six months behind, CPI is going to roll over. I wonder how different the experience in Europe might be in the next couple of years. From your perspective, the strikes that we see, the labour unrest in Europe, not only in the UK but also in France, how does that play into the stickiness of this inflation? don't know. It would be interesting to see. I think that union membership is a big part of this. And I think that if we had the union membership in this country, in the United States, that we did back in the 70s, that we would have seen a very, very different backdrop here in America. I mean, in terms of stickier uh, wage inflation. Uh, without a doubt. Although we the are past seeing, would have been huge. Although we are seeing more wage inflation in some of the uh, lower wage jobs than even the higher wage jobs at this point. So that's, kind of, uh, you know, on the margins, maybe. Equity futures right now on the S&P down about 1%. Massive week ahead. Federal Reserve decision on Wednesday. Payrolls report on Friday. Earnings from Meta, Amazon, Google, Apple. Take your pick. Just ridiculous this week, isn't it? All coming up a little bit later. Full preview still ahead. Looking forward to catching up with Ken Tropin, the CEO of Graham Capital. We'll do that next right here on Bloomberg Surveillance. We think structurally returns more broadly are going to be lower. We think that the global economy is in a relatively good shape and we expect to see a soft landing in the US but we also now expect to see a relatively soft landing in Europe. The Fed is beginning to kind of adjust to the fact that the economy is weakened and that it views itself as being in restrictive territory. I think the market is probably severely underpricing what the Fed may say. I think they are likely to be more hawkish. The market is actually in my view, underpricing the risk of heights for this year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz.
massive week ahead, so TK took the day off from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Counting you down to a massive week ahead with the Federal Reserve on Wednesday, payrolls on Friday and some earnings in between. Equity futures right now, Bramo down 1%. We've already got the big debate on Wall Street this morning. The South Side already publishing. On the one side, you've got Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, Miss Life Mataker, JP Morgan. On the other side, Max Kettner of HSBC saying you should chase this. Steve Chevron of Federated Hermits, super, super bearish through most of the last year, saying he was jumping on board with the rally so far this year. That's what I find interesting. The biggest bears are actually going in on this rally because they don't see a reason for it to stop. Just to, to give that sense of the polarity on the bond side, you've got Stephen Major on one side saying we might be close to the penultimate rate hike, which could signal a sustained bond rally, and then you have hedge funds boosting their short positions on treasuries to a record. So, again, this question around the push-pull of whether the Fed can really push back against a market and data that seems to be moving in the direction they want. A 10, 11 percent rally on the Nasdaq 100 will change the... Uh the narrative pretty quickly, and that's what's happened in the first three or four weeks of 2023. The bulls on the tech say that the job cuts that we've seen actually give some tailwind to this, that they're actually making the cuts necessary, and other people are saying this is just the beginning, and if you start to look at the, t at the chip sector, that indicates there's a lot more pain to come with a lack of investment in some of the areas that we saw during the peak of the pandemic. The weakness is being pushed out. Miss Life Mataker of JP Morgan acknowledging what could happen in Q1, in their view, will likely mark a turning point as the fundamental confirmation for the next leg higher might not come. Miss Life going on to say, and instead markets could encounter an air pocket of weaker earnings and activity as they move through Q2 and Q3. What happened to just the first half that was just going to be absolutely dreadful? and a second half that was going to deliver this big recovery. What's the saying that the market likes to exert the maximum amount of pain on everybody so it will just immediately flip? And I do wonder how much the consensus heading into this year of dip and rip really got turned on its head because of the consensus positioning. People got too far ahead of themselves amid data that still wasn't that bad. And all of a sudden it's rip and dip. I can't keep up. <laughs> Futures right now on the S&P, we're down about 1% on the S&P 500. Equities lower after a massive month of gains still in store for January. The Nasdaq up about 11% coming into Monday. EM equities up about 9.9%. Euro stocks 50 up about 10%. This is year to day stuff. So this is four weeks. The S&P 500 up about 6%. That that is still pretty decent. Yields look like this in a bond market, up five basis points on a 10-year, 355.51. Euro dollar just about holding on to levels in and around 109 at 108.99, positive a third of 1%. The data out of Europe, Lisa, we've been through it a couple of times, but if you are just tuning in, Spanish CPI came in hot and German GDP came in soft. So basically, it's stagflation, as you mentioned, which isn't, in, which isn't necessarily outright recession in the region, so perhaps, yay, go long. That seems to be the trade for a lot of people. This week, let's talk about uh, what we have on the docket. The FOMC rate decision is on Wednesday. We are doing a special on that, which is perhaps why Tom took the day off today. Bank of England and ECB rate decisions come on Thursday. Do we see a real bifurcation in the message from the Federal Reserve, perhaps taking more of a Bank of Canada tone, and the ECB taking a let's go, let's go kind of Fed last year uh, tone? Earnings. To me, I think the earnings might be even more important this year, because uh, this week, I should say, because uh, tech has led so far in 2023. Can it continue after the behemoth? report. We've got Meta on Wednesday, then we've got Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet all on Thursday. I'm curious about cloud computing. I'm curious about Amazon and its layoffs, who they're cutting, how they're uh, reducing expenses at a time when a lot of people are looking to them as perhaps some sort of bellwether uh, for the employment uh, picture. And then on the data front, we get JOLTS data on Wednesday. Thursday, we get non-farm productivity and jobless claims. And on Friday, we get both the January non-farm payrolls report as well as, and you pointed this out earlier, the ISM manufacturing and services sector data. You put this together, do we start to see some softening in a jobs market that has really been resilient to date? Fantastic week ahead. Huge Maybe. stories. <laughs> Huge stories. Huge it'll be, stories. It'll be data, a roller coaster. Payrolls, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England and some earnings in between. Joining us now to discuss, I'm really pleased to say, is Ken Tropin, the founder and chairman of Graham Capital, a hedge fund with $18 billion under management. Ken, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Let's start Thanks broad. Thanks for having me. The amount of central bank tightening we've seen over the last 12 months, there is a feeling that we can get away with something mild, something short, and then just move on. Ken, do you share that feeling, that view? I think that's too optimistic, personally. Um, you know, if you think about how 19, 2022 compared to the previous decade, uh, in the period between the end of the financial crisis, 2010 to 2021, we saw a total of 13 25 basis point equivalent rate hikes between the ECB, 
the Bank of England and the Fed. In 2022, one year, we saw 40, 25 basis point rate moves. Obviously, some of them came in 50 or 75 at a crack. So you've seen an enormous sea change in financial conditions. And I don't really think uh, the market reflects that necessarily um, in equity valuations. So how would you lean against it? I mean, would you basically move against some of the tech rally? Would you just go more into bonds? Um, you know, I think it's a good time to be um, very conservative. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, I think about is that for the last 11 years prior to 22, you were sort of rewarded for buying every dip in equities. I think that is the psychology of investors broadly. I think that psychology probably needs to shift. Uh, I think a 10% rally so far this year in equities seems um, like, okay, there was a big sell-off last year and people wanted to get back in with the sense that the Fed was gonna start easing in the second half of the year. We're not so convinced that they're gonna ease in the second half of this year, and there's still a lot of rate hikes priced in between the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of England. So. I would be really cautious, personally. What does it mean to be cautious, Ken, at a time when last year the 60-40 didn't work and, uh, frankly, the bond pro proponent, a component of the portfolio, had the worst year on record if you look at certain denominations? Is this a new time of that being a haven trade, or is that still really a difficult area? I think it's a difficult area. I like the two-year, you know. Uh, you've got the yield curve uh, really inverted here. And so uh, I think to be in one year uh, notes and, and and be patient makes a lot of sense. As you said, last year was the worst year for a 60-40 portfolio since uh, in 37 years. I mean, it's crazy. Ken, are you thinking inflation is going to be stickier than people I anticipate? Do. Is that what you're positioning I, I, for? I, 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 somewhat stickier, yes. I mean, it is definitely cooling, but, you know, uh, energy prices haven't gone down that much. They've come off the highs. But if you think about the world we're in, uh, you know, there's not any energy development in the United States. Uh, green policies, which we probably need because of global warming, really discourage more energy development. So resources are tight in, in inflation. Uh, if you look at labor, certainly there's softness in tech and finance. On the other hand, CBS and Walgreens are limiting hours because they can't get enough uh, employees. So. Um, I'm not convinced that uh, we're going to see inflation get anywhere near target uh, as soon as uh, the market would like. Ken, okay, where does that leave the yield curve right now? Deeply inverted. Some people think we can get that return yeah. of the bull steepener because the Federal Reserve is going to cut, save the day, deliver that steepening that we traditionally get. Ken, are you pushing back against that too then? I, I think the yield curve's moved a little uh, too much. Uh, you know, for all of the years I've been in finance, uh, there was term premium and duration risk priced into bonds. There is none today. It's the opposite. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me uh, if you think we have some inflation that may be around longer than another six or 12 months. Ken, we've been talking a lot about anecdotal signs of weakness in the labor market, whether it's big tech or even the big banks that have been cutting jobs on the margin. From your experience, do you think that those anecdotes reflect a real softening in the labor picture? Or do you think that there is more sustained strength than people realize? I think it's bifurcated. I think um, in high income uh, and in uh, jobs such as tech and finance and what have you, there's definitely softness. And I think in the service sector or, uh, you know, in, in, in more blue collar uh, jobs, not so much. And I also think we have the psychology of a, a lot of employees who are younger, who have never, uh, you know, endured a recession. And so they're being very patient about looking for jobs if they're laid off. That's a new phenomenon, I think. Again, just a final word from you. Your favorite trade this year, and you do not get to say the two-year, because you've said that already. What is it, Ken? Uh, well, the two-year is not a trade. It's just a good place to be conservative. Sure. Uh, I think uh, if I had to pick one thing, I, I, after stocks have gone up 10%, I probably would lean short. You'd go short right now? Uh, we're mixed. Our, some of our quant systems uh, are long equities while our discretionary traders are basically short. Is there a part of the equity market, Ken, that you think needs to be shorted more than most? Um, I, I think, well, if you look at uh, uh, the Hang Seng, that's gone up an enormous amount in the last three months. That looks really expensive to me. And I, I think broadly uh, in the U.S., if we are going to see a recession sometime this year, 
I don't think that's priced into the S&P at all. Ken, this was great. Isn't it nice the macro's back, Ken? Don't you agree? Isn't it uh, nice it's back? Know, it's the most exciting time to be in macro in 15 years. There's so much going on between what's happening uh, in the Ukraine, what's happening in inflation, all of these rate hikes. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a, a lifetime opportunity or who knows? You never know exactly what happens, but it's really exciting to be in macro. Well, Ken, it's exciting to talk to you, and let's do this more often. Fantastic, as uh, always. Ken Tripe in there of Graham Capital, a hedge fund with 18 billion AUM. Bramo, lean against maybe some of that equity market rally we've seen so far this year. In, the Hang Seng was an interesting point, this question yep. of how much, and you asked this question earlier, John, how much have we priced in already the reopening trade and perhaps even gotten over our skis before actually seeing the data on the ground and how that uh, opening will actually manifest itself? Take Baba. We're talking about 18, 90 percent moves in three months, three months. And we're coming into 23 and people are talking about the reopening trade. Like it's been going on well, since the start of November. Other people would say, well, look at the carnage last year. And this really is what Ken was talking about in terms of pushing against this idea that stocks will always go up, saying, you know, well, you know, we still have a long way to go before we can recover all of last year's losses. So let's go. It takes a long time to recondition the psychology of market participants. <laughs> That's evidently not, it does. Not just a 12 month sell off. Equities right now on the Nasdaq lower on the S&P lower too. We're down 1.2% on the Nasdaq 100. On the S&P, we are lower by about nine tenths of 1%. Coming up in the next hour on the bond market, Tony Rodriguez of Nuveen. Interesting to hear that comment from Ken there about maybe the 10-year yield is a little bit too rich, a little bit too low. The stickiness of inflation. Yeah. The Andrew Balls of PIMCO easy. last week in London said that could be the big risk yeah. for 23. All of that coming up and AMH on the other side of a commercial break. Looking forward to catching up with Anne-Marie down in DC shortly. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Iran, authorities say that a drone attack caused a heavy explosion at a defense ministry ammunition depot. The attack happened in the city of Isfahan. According to the Wall Street Journal, Israel carried out that strike. The journal says the aim was to look for new ways to contain Tehran's nuclear and military ambitions. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he cannot raise taxes to fund pay hikes for workers in the state-run National Health Service. Sunak told an office of health care workers that, quote, nothing would give me more pleasure than to wave a magic wand and have you paid lots more. Nurses and ambulance workers are both planning strikes on February 6th. The Federal Reserve is set to shrink interest rate hikes again this week. Policymakers are likely to raise their benchmark federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point on Wednesday. That would follow recent data suggesting the Fed's aggressive campaign to slow inflation is working. China is urging House Speaker Kevin McCarthy not to visit Taiwan. Beijing raised the specter of a repeat of last year's show showdown when McCarthy's predecessor, Nancy Pelosi, made her own trip to the island. McCarthy had pledged to make his own trip to Taiwan if Republicans took control of the House. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. He said he's not doing rallies. He's not campaigning. Maybe he's lost that step. Uh, we didn't. I'm more angry now and I'm more committed now than I ever was. There's only one president who has ever challenged the entire establishment in Washington. And with your vote next year, we will do it again and I will do it again. The race for 2024. The former president, Donald Trump, speaking at a rally in New Hampshire and South Carolina over the weekend. Let's head down to Washington, D.C. and catch up with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie, our Washington correspondent. AMH, let's start there. We talked about it. What campaign? We heard from the president, the yeah. former president, over the weekend. Yeah, he's out there. Two really important states, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Jonathan. But the criticism that's been against the former president within the Republican Party is that this campaign, I guess all before this weekend, was pretty much evaporated and it really lacks that momentum and excitement that he had in 2016. And this also comes at a time when you see others uh, starting to tee up potential bids that they also want to run in 2024. We've well, talked about this. We can like think Mike of two Pompeo, of them. Like, yeah, Governor yeah, DeSantis Mike down Pompeo. in Florida, 
throw in Nikki Haley. Anne-Marie, that's the Republicans, and we can focus on that, but we need to talk about what could be happening on the other side. I thought that we were going to hear from the current president after the holidays about his intentions. What's happened to that? Well, I think, one, you have the State of the Union coming up next week, February 7th. I also think this president knows that once he throws his name into the ring, while he is still the president, he'll also be viewed as a candidate. Americans much prefer uh, a president rather than a candidate to be president. So he's probably going to wait till after the State of the Union won if he does decide to announce to make that announcement. And also, Jonathan, uh, the White House has been dealing with the drip drip of the documents uh, crisis, whether it was at uh, the former uh, the president's former um, office he was using when he was vice president or at his home. That's starting to die down a bit, especially since Another former vice president, Mike Pence, there was documents also found in his home. So that is start, as that's starting to quell and that noise is getting under the control for the White House, potentially then they were going, they, then makes it more of an opportunity for them to come out in the next few weeks. And Marie, before we pivot, document gate, as John was talking about it before, what's behind this? Why is it that so many former officials of the U.S. government have classified documents at their homes? Is there some sort of logical explanation for this? This is a great question. Um, clearly, I think you're going to hear a lot of growing calls, and you already have from some members of Congress, to make sure that there is a better procedure logistically in place when officials are leaving their office and they are done with their term in office and they are packing up, that this does not happen. Um, and I think how you have to judge these, or the way we're going to probably get the Justice Department, is was their intent. This is really important when we hear from the special counselors, was their intent to steal these documents, to take these documents home, or were, the, were these accidents? But there's going to be a lot of questions about this because it, it's not just the, the current president, the former president, but it's also now also the former vice president. So clearly there, there's an issue. When we talk about uh, President Biden and whether he's going to run again and the announcement, there's a long way to go in terms of his actual staff and the overhaul that probably is going to come within the next few months. I think about his chief of staff and the potential for Lael Brainard to take that position as the front runner to uh, take on Brian Deese's role. Is there a sense of who would replace her on the Federal Reserve and making sure that that was an expedited process so as not to disrupt them? That is a question that people are asking, but so far there's been no names thrown out as a short list. Um, partially that is because they are still deciding whether or not it's going to be Lael Brainard to lead the National Economic Council. She is the definitely the front runner, but also we're going into an FOMC meeting. There's a blackout period. So until she's announced, you're not going to see any names circulate around on who could potentially take her spot. Just to be clear, Anne-Marie, do we have the reporting that suggests she wants this job? Um, well, the fact that she is a top contender, I think it makes sense that she probably does want this job, right? I, I think given where she is at the Fed, if she didn't want it, she probably was in a good position to st say, I think it makes sense for me to stay here, especially as we've seen the Fed on this aggressive rate tightening cycle. They're dealing with high inflation. Um, she had, I would say, a very good excuse if she wanted to stay. So um, I would read those tea leaves as this is something she wants to do. I don't think this is that controversial, you know, that Lael Brainerd's going to this government at all. I don't think it's that controversial at all. I think it's controversial to see how quickly they're going to replace her because a lot of people behind closed doors, the conversation is, what caused the extra spout of inflation? Well, part of it was the Fed didn't get on the ball early enough to raise rates in the second half of 2021, and part of that was a political reason because Fed Chair Jay Powell wasn't reconfirmed. And if he had been at that point, that perhaps he would have had more political capital to go ahead with That's it. That's what so, some people on the FOMC, former policymakers, have suggested. We oh, don't know, of course. We, we have no idea, but this has sure. been the speculation. So if you flip that over to now, what kind of potential issue does it, fall, does it cause if the number two on the Federal Reserve isn't replaced quickly? I don't think it changes much for the Fed. I know that people think on the margin it might make it more hawkish because Chairman Powell would have more control. I think Chairman Powell has control anyway. What would be interesting, think about the optics of this. You turn lower in the economy, perhaps you even have recession, and your chief economic advisor to the president going into potentially a race for 2024 in a second term is the number two, former number two from the Federal Reserve, who a lot of people in your own party are blaming for the economic fallout that they're witnessing. I think the optics of that 
could get tricky. You mean in terms of President Biden and what that could sure. mean for his reelection? Perhaps, although on the flip side, he could say he got somebody who had the credibility and the knowledge of the internecine workings of the Fed and how it played into the economy. I mean, there are a lot of ways to spin this, but you're right. It creates a complication on both sides. And I do wonder if it already has created that complication, regardless of whether she takes the job. I think you want the brightest minds in government. And that's one of the sharpest minds out there down in Washington, D.C., to take that position. The National Economic Council, I think, for her to put together and really lead the policy effort across government for this White House in this administration, I think that's a big, big issue. I think for this individual, though, just unsurprising when I saw this headline, totally, totally unsurprising. There were reports several years ago about donating to the Clinton campaign. We know that she was the front runner at one point to become the next Treasury Secretary. I'm just not surprised by this at all. And anyone who thinks the FOMC doesn't have political beasts on it, that they're out of their no. mind based on where the nominations have come from year after year, year after year. I don't think it's surprising, and I don't think it's surprising for her to want this job and for her to take this job and for her to be respected by a lot of people. What I do think that surprising is the timing, considering just how fraught this moment is for the Fed. We have not seen the full downturn. We haven't seen the unemployment rate materially turn upward. You start to get political interference and the allegations of that. As we head into that period of time, it gets a little more complicated. Oh, you think they're going to be allegations of political interference at the Federal Reserve? Well, I'm, yes, absolutely. You start to wonder on both sides. Either there is not going to be political Political interference, and they're going to perhaps hike rates more, and then people can push back and say, "Okay, well, they're just trying to torpedo uh, the uh, the party and and sort of the the uh, current administration." And if they are not hawkish enough, people will say it's because they want to keep the economy humming for the next election cycle. They always say this. I mean, you're laughing, but it, am I I'm wrong? I'm laughing because it's ridiculous. But I, I, I mean, know. But am I wrong? I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I just think the conversation around this Lel Brainerd nomination is ridiculous. Anne-Marie, down in D.C. We stop it then. <laughs> AMH, thank you. I just don't think it's that controversial. Don't think it changes much for the Federal Reserve. I think they're all basically on the same page at the moment. How much dissent have you seen from the FOMC over the last few years? How much dissent have you seen over the last few weeks going into this decision? They all seem to be on exactly the same page. I mean, should I continue talking about it since you think it's ridiculous? But I do no, think that I Lael Brainerd, think... I think that Lael Brainerd, though, has been on the margins more dovish. So that is sort of interesting if her voice gets eliminated and put toward the uh, the head of the Economic Council for the administration. OK. Should we end this? I'm happy to. <laughs> the clock's almost <laughs> up anyway. Laura Rame, the You're chief like, US goodness. economist at FS Investments. I think as journalists, we're always trying to make a story out of something, and I'm not sure how big the story actually is. Maybe many people disagree. I know you do and others will too. And that's just, okay. You know, I, I think that it's worth questioning because we spent so much time on this issue of could this Fed go through with rate hikes at a time of true economic softening, right? And maybe we'll skip that debate entirely because we'll get this immaculate disinflation. But if we don't, then it becomes a more political question. I think the data is more important than whether Brainerd's on that committee or not. I think that a lot of people would agree with you. Futures right now down nine tenths of 1%. On the S&P 500, yields a bit higher up by five basis points, 354.95 on a 10-year. Laura Rain of FS Investments coming up. Equity futures down lower, negative on the S&P on the Nasdaq 2, going into a monster week for financial markets worldwide. Equities now down 9 tenths of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, lower by 1.2%. Do you want to chase this or fade this? Saying chase, Steve Chevrona federated a little bit earlier this morning on this program, saying fade this. Miss Laugh Mateka over at JP Morgan, Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley, that list is growing in the face of a big rally here today so far in the first month of 23. Get to the bond market. Yields look like this. Twos, tens and thirties on a 10-year yield tied by four basis points. 354.77 on a two-year. 423.41. Yields up a little bit across the curve at the front end by three or four basis points also. And just to finish on foreign exchange, I mentioned this a few times, but for those of you still tuning in, waking up potentially slight side. It's very late. Euro dollar 108.99. I wish I could wake up at 7.30 that you want for waking up at a decent time. It's very late. Oh, my God. 108.99 <laughs> on euro dollar. Spanish CPI came in hot. German GDP came in soft. Over the next couple of days, you'll hear from France, Germany, Italy, 
on their inflation story going into the ECB, Lisa, this Thursday. So earlier this morning, you know how Ken Tropin of Graham Capital was talking about uh, fading some of the Hang Seng. We seem to be seeing that a little bit in markets today. And I want to just to point out Alibaba, JD.com and Trip.com, all the ADRs of these Chinese companies. And you can see a real uh, market sell off. Again, this isn't necessarily anything in particular, except perhaps people coming back to the office, seeing the reopening post Lunar New Year and saying, wait a second, maybe we got a little far. Uh, you can see Alibaba shares uh, down 5.3 percent, JD.com down 4 percent, uh, and you see TripAdvisor uh, down 2.1 percent. Then if you flip over into some of the other big winners over the past week, Tesla shares last week surged 33 percent, a little bit off that froth. We're seeing it down uh, at one point, about a 1 percent decline on the Tesla shares, but now down just six tenths of a percent. Amazon.com, ahead of the Thursday report, also lower. So again, perhaps people pushing back against some of the enthusiasm, the rally to date down 1.2 percent. And Micron, I'm watching the, the chip uh, makers quite closely, considering that they've given some pretty negative projections. Those shares dropping a further 1.2 percent. After the bell today, we get NXP semiconductors reporting earnings. What is going on there? Is this just an uh, ongoing distortion with inventories built up, or is this something more material with perhaps a misplacement of which chips have been produced and for when, right? I mean, this to me is a, is a real big question in markets. It's your point, Lisa. You said this a few times earlier this morning. The earnings haven't been great, No, have they? they haven't been. And so I don't understand people saying, well, if you look at the earnings, that's a reason to rally. Well, is it? The guidance from Microsoft. <laughs> it's been absolutely dreadful. The numbers dreadful. from Intel. I mean, honestly, Intel was, uh, some people would say kitchen sink, but other people say there are a lot of kitchen sinks there, and this is a problem. A lot of kitchen sinks there. <laughs> Somebody the said that numbers. to me. I mean, it was like... pretty brutal, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. Ugly stuff. Fed meeting on Wednesday. Payrolls on Friday. Going into that Fed meeting, Lara Rame of FS Investment saying this. A 25 basis point rate hike is widely expected, of course. I expect the committee to say that further increases are necessary. The battle for rate cut expectations will really heat up and the Fed will be pushing back hard against the idea that rate cuts are necessary. Lara Rame, the chief US economist at FS Investments, joins us right now. So, Lara, this is the question going into Wednesday in that news conference. If it's not addressed in the statement, are uh, the recent easing, the recent easing of financial conditions warranted or not? And, Lara, I wonder how you think, one, he'll answer that question, and two, whether this market and market participants will actually listen to him. You know, whether they're warranted is really a reflection of the fact that the markets have been trained in part by the Fed to look so far ahead of the curve on the economy that I think they can be too hasty. And in this case, there was so much talk about a recession at the beginning of last year, a recession at the beginning of this year. To me, you know, you really need to look for the timing of this almost a year after the Fed stops raising rates which is why I've penciled in late 2023 for an economic slowdown. And it means that at earliest, the Fed would really not consider sort of lowering that curve and cutting rates until much later in the year. And for all of those, you sort of paint that macro backdrop. And it means that markets who are pricing in three rate cuts this year are, have just gotten too aggressive. That's pulled down the front end. And look at what we've had mortgage refinancings have reignited again. We're about to see the housing market come back to life. The Fed hasn't really broken anything. They have put a pin in all of these interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy. And guess what? When rates come down, those all reflare. And I think that's what the, the push and pull we're going to see over the next year. And really, it's going to start this Wednesday. Lots to unpack there, Lara. Can I just pick up on your call that you don't think the weakness comes until year end? Lara, what guides yes. that view? Okay, you have to take out a microscope to find weakness in the labor market. We have had upsetting headlines on in some key industries like the tech sector, but the reality is these are sectors that overhire during the pandemic. They're trying to right size that right now. And to me, when you look at the broader initial claims, the unemployment rate at three point five percent, jolts data, the vacancy rate. I mean. Go down the list, Jonathan, pick anything. It is just very difficult to find any signs of outright weakness. Normalization, cooling, all of that is actually healthy. And then on the consumer side, I would argue there's a similar situation. There's been a lot of talk about delinquencies picking up and consumer banks are being cautious. That is their job. I think at the end of the day, when you saw the earnings from 
MasterCard, from all from American Express, the consumer is healthy. With jobs where they are, I think the household can continue to spend. And lower inflation has a role to play in that, too. It's not a strong growth picture. It's a grind. But I think it stays positive. Laura, you said the Fed hasn't broken anything. And then you talk about all these pockets of strength that could keep inflation hotter than the Fed would like. Is the implication here that the Fed has to break something? And then what is it that they have to break? Well, that's what a recession is at the end of the day. It means that they have taken something and pushed it too far. Our economy doesn't like to contract, so it needs something to be not working right to, to really uh, fall into contraction. So, you know, they have talked a lot about the labor market. They've talked a lot about wages. And, you know, we need wages to come down pretty significantly, and I'm just not sure that's going to happen given the... Uh, limited number of job availability that at the end of, I think when they think about targeting something to really slow the economy at a broader level, it often is the labor market. But I think right now they're content with some broader slowing. They just see the need to continue to raise rates. I don't think that's going to change. It's time for them to slow down. No doubt about it. I think they're doing the right thing over the next several meetings. So a lot of people took some signal from the Bank of Canada, which has been on the front foot when it comes to uh, their moves and their central bank. And they just indicated they're going to go 25 basis points. They went 25 basis points. And they potentially will hold indefinitely. Why is the Fed not going to do that, since it doesn't seem to bother them that much, that financial conditions keep easing? I, I, would, I would push back that it may bother them somewhat. I mean, I think they see it. I think they recognize that um, when long-term interest rates come down, it undoes some of their rate hike activity. And um, while I think that they're going to continue to monitor this, I think they recognize that they can't only focus on it because it's not their main mandate. Their mandate is inflation. And until we see it not just hit 2%, but hit inflation persistently at 2%, they have wiggle room to manage expectations, and financial conditions are going to be a big part of that. I think they are going to keep watching financial conditions very closely, especially over the next six months. We're catching up with Jim Bianco of Bianco Research a little bit later this morning. And in his recent note, he said, I think the narrative and attention should now turn to how far down we're going to go, not whether inflation has peaked. Laura, can you speak to that? Are we coming down to four, or are we going to find it difficult to get down to two? Yeah, the inflation numbers are going to look so choppy. This is just because year-on-year -year base effects are going to make the headline number just really come down very fast. I think, you know, we've now sort of contorted ourselves in the monthly CPI numbers of looking at, you know, services, wages that are excluding shelter. I mean, we've gotten, I think, too micro on the CPI data. We need to step back and we need to include wages in that conversation. We need to include sort of numbers that are in the medium term versus just the near term. Inflation expectations are part of that too. And those have been stickier. So to me, it's really a more holistic inflation picture. And I think the Fed is going to be very focused on more than just one piece of CPI. And the labor dynamics are very critical to that. That's what their medium-term models key off of. Laura, what are you watching most closely this week in terms of the economic data, the Fed meeting, as well as earnings? I mean, nothing beats the payroll reports, Lisa. You have to pay a ton of attention to those. So to me, that's, we're really going to end with a bang on that. I think the employment cost index numbers are going to be really important this week as well. It's fascinating that just a few months ago, there was no space for nuance. Then all of a sudden, the CPI discussion just became really nuanced. Did you notice that with Chairman Powell? I do wonder how much this is just going back to uh, this feeling that people want to rally. And Chair Powell, I mean, to your point, you think that there's been a big pivot. You think that he has changed his tone I wouldn't say a big pivot. I, over I'd, the past couple of weeks. I'd say, Lisa, something subtle happened where he went from saying the risk of doing too little outweighed the risk of doing too much. And it seemed that in a couple of months towards the end of the year, that view became a little bit more balanced. I don't think we've had that full pivot yet. I think where there is a massive spread at the moment, and you appreciate this, and, and Lara does too, is between where the Fed is saying what it will do this year, which is a second phase of their effort to tame inflation, is just to keep rates unchanged against the backdrop of disinflation. That means you stay tighter than this market thinks, and this market's looking at rate cuts. And if we reconcile that spread with the market coming up to the Fed, 
And that's going to come with some rate volatility. And if we get that rate vol climate again, then we've got a problem for risk assets too. You know what no one's ever talking about anymore? What's that? The balance sheet roll-off. I know, QT. Why is nobody talking about that? It's actually happening. I mean, not that fast, but, you know, we've seen $500 billion taken down from the balance sheet and it's going to keep going and keep grinding and keep accelerating on that front. So even if Fed keeps rates at 45 to 5%, it's going to be an ongoing tightening. Why is nobody talking about that? Because it's that? like watching paint dry. That's what they want it to be. It's not, of course, at all. <laughs> Maybe it is, because nobody's course, talking about it. I agree with you. But I, I just, you know, where does that come into play? Because there's so much money in the system still, and everybody has money, and let's spend money, and as soon as people want to feel risky, uh, risky, they can go into whatever they want because they've got the money. Well, what happens when it gets drained from the system a little bit more? At least they got what they wanted on that front. They wanted it to be like paint drying, and to your point, no one's discussing it. Maybe they should be. It doesn't really come up in a presser either. It never comes up. Not at all. Is it paint drying? I don't I know. Don't, it's, I it's... don't look. I don't think it is. But Lisa, I was so wrong on the ECB getting to two fifty without there being real damage yeah. in the bond market. At least when I say real damage, I thought it'd be monster damage in the peripheral bond market. I was wrong about that. So maybe QT is like paint drying for this Federal Reserve. I don't know. It's not to me. It's not to you. But that's not really what counts, is it? <laughs> no, but that's the market seems to be saying. We like watching paint dry. It's nice. Did I say thanks to Lara? I'm not sure I did. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, Lara. It's a bit late. I'm sure she's gone. <laughs> no, she's like, she's like bit, those guys talking about QT. John and Rochester of Namora joins us next on this FX market. That's next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden will meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy Wednesday to discuss raising the debt ceiling and avoiding a U.S. default. Republicans want a deal that includes government spending cuts. The president has refused to negotiate over the debt limit. In Germany, the economy shrank two-tenths of one percent at the end of last year. That was worse than expected, and it makes a recession more likely after all. Soaring inflation, in part due to higher energy bills, has weighed on German household spending. Billionaire Gautam Adani attempts to restore confidence in his business empire. Well, that's falling flat with investors. Shares of most Adani Group firms slumped again today. The sell-off has now erased about $68 billion in market value. Over the weekend, Adani issued a 413-page rebuttal to allegations of fraud by short seller Hindenburg Research. Toyota is the world's largest automaker for the third year in a row. The Japanese company's sales were mostly flat at 10.5 million units for the year. Meanwhile, Volkswagen, Volkswagen sales, they fell 7% to 8.3 million units, its lowest level of deliveries in 11 years. And Bloomberg's learned that the Chinese search giant Baidu will roll out an artificial intelligence chatbot similar to OpenAI's ChatGPT. The tool will allow users to get conversation-style search results. It's set to debut in March. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. that the, the dollar could come under a little bit of pressure. Uh, the Bank of Japan as well is starting to adjust its, its, its YCC. So I think the, the you know, dollar is definitely peaked. I don't see a pre precipitous decline, but, but a gradual decline as other central banks catch up on the policy front. So Badra Japa there of Sogjen, always wonderful to hear from her on this bond market and on central banks too. Central bank decisions are plenty this week. The Federal Reserve Wednesday, the BOE, the Bank of England and the ECB coming up on Thursday. Going into all of that, some earnings and a splash of economic data. Equities are lower this morning. We're down by eight or nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. What's wrong with you? It you sounds like at? a cooking channel. I know. A it's a, re of it's a recipe, a recipe for uncertainty. Mm. Oh, that's and, good. And lower markets. I like that. And higher bond yields by four basis points, 354.77. That's how the table is set going into the Federal Reserve <laughs> decision. Have you ever heard this quote? Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Oh, you just read yeah. it to me. Yeah, I like it. Okay. Now listen to this one. I just got sent this. This is brilliant. Low interest rates create weak men. Weak men create high interest <laughs> rates. There's a picture of Chairman Powell there on that one. Oh, boy. High interest rates create strong men, and strong men create low interest rates. There's a picture of Volcker at the end. What do you make of that? <laughs> you want me to take it seriously? Because I actually think it's great. There's a regime story I mean, in there. It, it, there's a regime story. There is a story of 
men, great and small. No, honestly, I mean, it's, it's easy to have a business model with free money. It is harder to have a business model with expensive money. And that is perhaps what we're seeing. I don't know if we can talk about strong men versus weak men. We're very inclusive here. Men. People. You. you can people. replace yeah, the thanks. word men with people. Highly, highly inclusive stuff. Equities down on the S&P by 8 tenths of 1%. Yields up by four basis points on a 10-year at 354. Euro dollar just back through 109. CPI in Spain, hot. GDP in Germany, soft. Going into more inflation reads and an ECB decision on Thursday. And a stronger euro and all this optimism, constructive stuff about the future of Europe relative to the doom and gloom and less constructive stuff over the last 12 months. Jordan Rochester joins us now, G10FX strategist over at Nomura. Jordan, great to catch up with you, sir. So it is conference season, which means you leave London, you go around Europe and you try and pitch your ideas. And Jordan, I just wonder how many people are on board with this constructive Europe, long Euro story from the people you speak to? Well, we've been around the world recently and I've had probably one client that's pushed back a lot on the Euro view. Uh, mostly from a positioning angle as well. So when it comes to positioning data and also just the proxies, CTA positions, momentum, uh, all of those sort of ways we can judge how overexposed investors are to this long euro short dollar trade, that's, that is the problem. It's Everybody seems to agree. So now we, we're entering into a world of how can things go wrong? And the GDP numbers from Sweden stand out this morning, coming in weak as well as Germany. Maybe the optimism in the surveys that we've seen in the past month are just a flash in the pan. I don't think it is a flash in the pan. I think there are key reasons why Euro can go higher. But it is now the case that it is a consensus view. So my job now is to keep an eye out for how things can go wrong. How much is the divergence in central bank momentum or direction really the only driver here between uh, what we're seeing with Euro going higher and dollar going weaker? Well, I think the FX component to rates, that correlation, it's the bread and butter of foreign exchange. If you had an ECB view that was strong, and if you had a Fed view that was strong, you could express it in both rates and FX, and they were highly correlated to each other. It's not the case anymore. Rates do their own thing. FX does another. The balance of flows are trade-dominated and fixed-income dominated, as well as equities. So it really depends on where you see those flows going. The most uh, c consistent factor to follow is growth. So if you think growth's improving, the dollar it will weaken, uh, global growth, that is. So in this environment we're currently in, with energy prices lower, with fiscal stimulus in Europe, with the potential reopening in China, it's all positive for European growth. And there's a big momentum change to what we had last year. So in that environment, euro area growth could outperform the US, or at least from where we were in terms of pricing. So in that environment, I see euro dollar going towards 110 very quickly. I know we're nearly there. I had it as my target by the end, by, by end of day tomorrow. Um, it might, that might be a little bit too much in just one day. But we're looking for 113 in Q2 and 116 by year end. Jordan, you said potentially reopening in China. What do you have to see there for the euro to go higher? Well, China is reopening, uh, but we have to take it in the stages. Right now, we're still coming out of the situation over the winter, which was high levels of COVID cases, and confidence in China uh, still being rocked around. There's also how long the feed-through is to growth data. We, we could still see weak China data for the next few months, and we don't see the rebound, perhaps, until the second half of this year, the material rebound. I'm optimistic that the spring weather, so from end of March onwards, April, May, we could really see a rebound in China's reopening, and hopefully we see some fresh fiscal stimulus. Who knows? That could really accelerate the story. So that's why I think the big move in the euro, higher, could come in Q2 as we go into that warmer weather. And then it slows down towards the end of this year. So you think that Europe imports a stronger growth impulse. Does it import the inflation story too? This is where Europe stands out. And I think the Spanish data was really interesting this morning. So all my leading indicators for euro area inflation and the US, they're collapsing. They suggest, they suggest disinflation, expect lower prices. Then you get Spain. And Spain leads euro area inflation by two months because they're more exposed to energy prices with floating contracts. And it came in hot today. And I didn't expect that. Most economists thought we'd have a big slowdown. So it could be the case, I think, John, that US inflation continues to really slow down. I think we could have goods deflation in Q2. We already are having signs of that anyway. Where in Europe, because of the big fiscal stimulus, 7% of German GDP, you know, this could lead to um, a um, sort of difference in inflation, where inflation rebounds in the second half this year in Europe, whilst the US is slowing down. So we do have the ECB cut, uh, hiking rates all the way to 3.5% and then keeping them on hold for the rest of this year. Very different story for the US. We have them raising rates until the end of March and then cutting rates towards uh, Q4. So that story 
could see the euro outperform just because of a hotter inflation environment. And the big part is thanks to the fiscal stimulus, but also the bigger exposure to China. Germany's three times more exposed to China via trade than the US. Jordan, just to build on that, you clearly think that is a euro strength story based on your projections as implied by the fact you think the euro dollar gets out to 116 near year end. Jordan, what's the risk that actually ends up being a euro weakness story? The main factor is if we flick from the dollar smile, which we're currently in, which is things are good elsewhere, therefore the dollar weakens. If we were to flick not towards US growth outperformance, because I really don't see that happening. You haven't got any fiscal stimulus coming this year. Republicans with the House will make it very difficult to even get the debt uh, uh, limit ceiling raised. But we could have the other side of the dollar smile, which is big risk off credit spreads widen, European assets underperform. Very possible, but that, that's a gray swan. It's a black swan. You, you can kind of hope for the best, um, prepare for the worst. So if we did see that credit spread widening, a lot of people would be quick to get out these euro dollar longs because but we just don't know what that is. It's kind of just waiting around. What I will say, John, is the good news is the EU have been very good at playing a game of whack-a-mole. All of last year, they were very good at dealing with any problem that came up. The EU provided loans or assistance or fiscal stimulus. This time around, because we're still with Russia and Ukraine at war, I think the EU will be quick to help out with any credit stress like this, unlike the US, where Joe, Joe Biden's hands might be more tied by Congress. Jordan, just quickly, wouldn't the greatest word to use Europe for you, Europe right now just be stagflation? Uh, and why aren't people using it? Oh, we used it a lot last year. Stagflation was everything. Growth lower, higher inflation. This story now is disinflation, potential deflation, especially in the US, but disinflation. So inflation coming off the very high levels, base effects helping, but also we're seeing signs that firms are charging less ahead. So that's kind of, it's actually good for your real GDP forecast. You can lower your inflation forecast, whilst growth in the euro area has been very weak last year. We've had very, very early signs in the January data of a bounce back. And I really hope that carries on in February. Uh, if that bounce back happens, it's not the word to use stagflation. It's a growth recovery. Revise up your real GDP forecasts. OK, we'll see. Jordan Rochester of Nomura on the latest on the FX market. Thank you, sir. I mentioned this because if I told you two years ago that we had 0% GDP growth in Germany and inflation pushing double figures, I think you'd have a word for that. Yeah. And that word's not being used. Well, no, because it's negative and people are sick of it. I think that people are just sick of the narrative of last year, so they're trying to change it for this year. So it's lots of growth, even though you're not really seeing growth and in Europe, and it's uh, disinflation in the U.S. or outright deflation. You know, to some degree, it's because there are signs of growth in a new way in Europe that we haven't seen for a little bit in terms of China reopening. Like, that's actually uh, truly giving some it increase in demand. Things. It Agreed. could change things, particularly in the auto industry, particularly in Germany, but you're not seeing it yet, to your point. So, you know, at what point do people just start calling it what it is? Well, it is exactly what it is, right? And we've got stagnation. We haven't got recession, I get that. We've got stagnation, though, and we've got inflation, which is close to double digits, and you can make the argument that maybe that's going to change in the next 12 months, but just trying to make an assessment on where we are right now. But often it's it's the direction, right? Stagflation means that it's stagnant, that there's not necessarily a direction that it's moving in. And a lot of people are seeing the prospect, particularly with fiscal stimulus in Europe and, and, and China coming back online, that it's not going to stay this way. To your point of, are we going to see people actually go long? I'm starting to sound like you. I know. Like, what is this? I've got no idea. <laughs> I mean, this I've is ridiculous. It's been two I weeks. I haven't sat with you for it's ages. Really nice. So there you go. Equity futures down eight or nine tenths of one percent. Very Bramo esque stagflation, <laughs> Europe, all that gloom. I'm doom, fighting against it. All that stuff. Yields up four basis points, three fifty four fifty eight. Coming up next, Tony Rodriguez. The recession that people feared six months ago is not happening. There's a decent amount of momentum going into the fourth quarter. If you look at equities, we're sort of middle of the road. The key thing, I think, for corporate profitability, the outlook for earnings, is really nominal money. The thing I think would be destabilizing, volatility inducing, would be if it looks like inflation is going to get stuck. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The Fed decision on Wednesday. Payrolls on Friday. 
some central bank decisions and earnings in between. Is that enough for you? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Brabitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures right now down nine-tenths of 1% on the S&P. Really bucking the trend of the year so far. What a month of gains we've seen Bramo taking place. Led by the sector that was evidently dead and never going to reassert its uh, leadership over the index, which was big tech, which has reasserted its leadership. And a lot of people are going all in. How long can that last, considering all of the negatives that people had, all those arguments that seem to not be applicable anymore? Over to you, Chairman Powell. Chairman Powell, we all have one question. The easing of financial conditions, warranted or unwarranted? How do you plead? <laughs> do they care, right? I mean, because basically you're seeing the market move in an opposite direction to what they ostensibly would want, unless there's enough weakness to give them confident that they're still moving in this sort of immaculate disinflation. And I still call it immaculate disinflation because this whole question of a soft landing is unheard of in a tightening cycle. Sure. So. Is this time different? You've been on top of this story, and I want to build on it too. It's not just about how he answers that question. It's how market participants choose to respond to that response to that question. Because over the last couple of months or so, I have to say, the chairman's spoken. They've all spoken. They've all said we're not cutting any time soon, and this market's still pricing in cuts. They keep pricing in cuts, even as Fed officials come out and say, we're going to five, we're going to five and a quarter. Potentially, the upside risk is still there. And people shrug it off because they say, look at the data. It's in our favor. And so at a certain point, you have to see the data. But which data? That's my issue. Because if you start to see jobs that come in much stronger than people expect on Friday, is that going to be the key data point for this week? Perhaps that's an important question, too. With that in mind, what's more important, the Fed decision on Wednesday or the data that we get through the rest of this week and into Friday? I would guess the data, uh, and specifically, I mean, I'm just going to piggyback on what Lara Rehm was talking about, this question of the cost index, the employment cost index, and how much uh, the, the, the price of employees is going up. People are demanding uh, higher wages. Is that going to give the Fed some pause, especially with jolts coming out on Wednesday? The bias is pretty clear, isn't it? that most people just assume inflation is going to come down. And really, the question is, how does the Fed respond to that? The market says cuts. The Fed says, no, we're going to hold and we're going to see this through. The big risk going through the rest of this year is what happens if inflation is far, far stickier than people expect. Andrew Balls of PIMCO joined us last week, and he talked about that. He didn't say it was his base case, but it's certainly a risk. And we're hearing that from Andrew Hollenhorst of City. City really believes that there is a hawkish surprise in store here from this Federal Reserve. Perhaps not at this meeting, maybe in March. And ultimately, it comes down to this view. And here's the quote. We expect upcoming stronger core inflation to challenge this most recent version of the transitory inflation narrative. I think the quote of the last couple of months on this program was Sarah House of Wells Fargo when she came on and talked about the final mile. And she said, the final mile, when you get down to four, then give me the then what? How difficult will it be to get from four back down to two? I'll give you an anecdote. The housing market the first rate-sensitive sector that everyone was looking at as a possible area of collapse or at least a significant downturn. We've seen it start to rebound. We've start, started to see it uh, actually stabilize in terms of home sales not posting that big of a decline, considering that home prices have actually climbed slightly. The fact that you're starting to see people refinance their mortgage rates as they come down. I mean, honestly, there are so many points that really suggest you can't kill this beast that quickly. Lots of people writing in this morning, including Barry Knapp of Ironsides. On the Bloomberg, he says, payrolls over the presser. The payrolls report more important than the presser. I'll ask that question through this week for you, going into payrolls and the presser later this week. Payrolls on Friday, the press conference and Fed Chair Jay Powell at his delivery on Wednesday. Equities right now down nine-tenths of 1% on the S&P. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq a whole lot lighter, lower, negative, down to kick off the trading week. In the bond market, yields a bit higher by four or five basis points on a 10-year, 354.95. In Europe, it's all about the ECB on Thursday and the data between now and then. Inflation in Spain came in hot. GDP in Germany came in soft. And you'll get in CPI reads from France, Germany and Italy over the next couple of days, Lisa. So somebody wrote in uh, regarding Europe and our discussion on stagflation. If this stagflation isn't stagnant, is it transitory? <laughs> I think that okay. everyone's getting that's a little exhausted. That's, everyone's that's a little too, exhausted from all of these no, catchphrases. No, I think I need a few hours sleep to get my head around that. <laughs> Tony Rodriguez joins us now, the head of fixed income strategy at Nuveen. Tony, can we start with that question? What's more important to you this week? Is it the news conference with Chairman Powell on Wednesday or the payrolls report on Friday? Well, good morning, Jonathan. Good to be with you. And uh, for us, clearly, the answer is the data in the employment report. We think that the press conference, uh, we certainly expect Fed Powell to be relatively hawkish 
in terms of his pressure. Uh, the idea for him is that there's no upside, really, to turning dovish at this point. Financial conditions are easing. The market's moving in that direction. He wants to push back on that a little bit. So I don't expect that to be a very eventful uh, Fed meeting or press conference. But when we look at the data there, there, I think, is quite a substantial amount of possibility for a surprise to the market in either direction. Uh, we think that the consensus is going to be, you know, in the ballpark accurate. So we think some of the trends that we're seeing right now, both with respect to the data and on, on the economy and the data on inflation, are likely to continue here over the next couple of months. So how do you uh, push back against people who are starting to say that it's a little too neat for the 10-year yield to continue to decline through this year and for people to get confidence that the Fed both has control over inflation but also won't crush this economy? Yeah, you bring up a very good point, Lisa. I mean, right now we think that the rate story is probably about right. We think rates will be range-bound here until later in the second half of the year. And then we'll begin to price in some of the economic weakness and slowdown that we're expecting. So we're forecasting the 10-year maybe ends the year at three and a quarter, not far from here, but the direction continues to be lower. Where we think there's a little bit of a disconnect is that we think there'll be some economic slowing. We think that'll cause the Fed to certainly pause. But our view is that 23 is the year of the pause and not the pivot. So we wouldn't be expecting any cuts until 24. And when you put those two things together, it means that you know, the returns you've seen so far in January and since October, uh, you don't want to be annualizing those. We think that there will be some reversal here and some give back in terms of the very strong start that we've had to the year as risk assets kind of repriced to a little bit less rosy scenario. Rehearsal. Does this mean that you're selling investment grade and high yield bonds? <laughs> no, no, we're not selling here. We're definitely focusing on the higher quality segment of the high yield bond market, the emerging markets of leveraged loans. So we don't want to dip down into lower quality because we do think there's still some uh, risk here as we move through the next couple of months. And we want to have some powder dry. So we would be uh, expecting to increase our risk exposure over the next call it one to four months because we do think we'll see some repricing, a little bit of weakness, a little bit of spread widening. So those better entry points, you want to have some powder dry to take advantage of them. Tony, what do you make of the spread tightening? we've seen in high yield with the data where it is the pmi's sub 50 the default rate arguably this year coming from a very low base granted but moving in the wrong direction expectations that unemployment is going to be higher not lower what do you make of the spread tightening we've seen in the face of all of that yeah so jonathan if we go back to where we were say in october we think the direction of tighter than where we were at that point makes sense. The data has certainly been more resilient. When you think about the macroeconomic data, the inflation data has certainly been better. When you think about the expectations for Europe, those have been substantially better because we were hoping for a warm winter, but we hadn't had it yet. And of course, the China reopening, the regulatory crackdown easing, that's all been better news. So I think the direction is correct, but I think it's just gone a little bit too far. So right now we're talking about a high yield market that's has, is pricing at an implied default rate of around 2.7, 2.8%. We think it's moving above 3%, but it's not going to be to a level that becomes really disruptive for the financial market. So again, our view is that there needs to be a little bit of a backup here and, and repricing because it's gone maybe a little bit too far. But the broad direction is pricing in some of the better news on both inflation and growth that we're expecting to be a really continue over the first half of the year. So, Lisa, you take the wides from, say, the end of September, not the ultimate wides of last year, but wide enough through 550. I think we're about 150 basis points south of where we were at the end of Q3, the start of Q4. Yeah, if you take a look at it, since June of last year, it, the spread was about six percentage points over benchmark rates for high yield bonds. Now it's four. Just to give you a sense of the, the, the direction of travel, can we get an economic cycle without the default cycle? That's really without what I'm asking. Without unemployment, unemployment going, going up, with so inflation what, so what coming what exactly off, is going wrong? <laughs> it's just, you know, distortions that have been righted. I mean, that's what a lot of people seem to be stealthily believing, underpinning a lot of these trades. Just ultimate surgery. We just take out the distortions and there's no collateral damage. Well, I mean, is that what we're pricing in? The immaculate disinflation, your favorite phrase. Well, I think that that seems to be... I mean, I'd ask Tony this, right? Is that okay, basically you've got what's enough being... time to ask Tony. Tony, is that what we're pricing in here? The immaculate disinflation with just surgical removal, to quote John, of the distortions? 
Well, like I said before, I do think that we've got a little bit of ahead of a little bit ahead of ourselves here in terms of market pricing. If you had talked to us back in November, I think I would have said that the possibility of a soft landing was maybe 30 percent, 70 percent was a kind of mild recession. But as we sit here today, because things have moved in the right direction, I'd say that's a bit more balanced, more of a 50-50 that the Fed is possibly able to achieve it. So markets are certainly. Uh, should be pricing in better levels today than we were back in October. It's just that right now, the pricing in of cuts in the second half, uh, again, looking at what the returns were in January and thinking you might be able to annualize that kind of return, that to us is way too optimistic. It's going to be a little bit longer period for this economy to bring inflation back down close to the Fed's target. We don't see that till the end of 24. So we do think that, you know, what you saw in the GDP about final sales to domestic purchase around a 1% type of growth level, that to us makes a lot of sense, that we're going to be sitting here in a 0 to 1% growth environment in 23. So that is not one where you need you should be pricing in you know, high yield at a 25 to 3% default rate. You need to price in closer to a 35 to 4%, but you don't need to price in a great financial crisis level of defaults. Hey, Tony, this was great. It's good to catch up. Tony Rodriguez there of Nuveen looking ahead to the week ahead and ultimately suggesting that for him at least, what is most important to him is the data at the end of the week and maybe not what Fed Chair Jay Powell has got to say on Wednesday. Coming up on the earnings, Tom Forte, the senior research analyst at DA Davidson. We've got Apple, Meta, Google, Amazon all coming up this week. This is Bloomberg. you up today with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo in iran authorities say that a drone attack caused a heavy explosion at a defense ministry ammunition depot the attack happened in the city of isfahan according to the wall street journal israel carried out that strike the journal says the aim was to look for new ways to contain tehran's nuclear and military ambitions in the uk prime minister rishi sunak says he cannot raise taxes to fund pay hikes for workers in the state-run national health services sunak told an audience of health care workers that quote nothing would give me more pleasure than to wave a magic wand and have you paid lots more nurses and ambulance workers are both planning strikes on february 6th the federal reserve is set to shrink interest rate hikes again this week Policymakers are likely to raise their benchmark federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point on Wednesday. That would follow recent data suggesting the Fed's aggressive campaign to slow inflation is working. The CEO of TikTok will testify before a House committee on the company's privacy policies and its relationship with China's Communist Party. That hearing is set for March 23rd. It will be Sho Zichu's first appearance on Capitol Hill. FBI Director Christopher Wray has said China's government could use Tic Tac to control millions of users' data or software. And Boeing predicts China will jumpstart global air travel this year. The jet maker says the reopening of China's borders will boost travel almost to all pre-COVID levels. Now a Boeing executive reiterated the company's forecast that airlines will need another 41,000 planes over the next 20 years with China as a key buyer. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. If you look at equities, we're sort of middle of the road, but think about the opportunities, the valuations that really needed to come down. It's in software, it's in tech, it's in venture, and we have started to see a pretty meaningful reset there. It was Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, Chief Investment Strategist, live from New York, looking ahead to the Fed decision on Wednesday, payrolls on Friday, and some earnings and some economic data in between. Equity futures down this morning, this Monday, to kick off the trading week. We're down by eight tenths of 1% on the S&P. The Nasdaq even lower, yields a bit higher by five basis points, 355.51, and euro dollar 109.03, positive a third of 1%. Spanish CPI to kick off the week coming in hot. The ECB set to hike 50 basis points on Thursday, after most people expect the Federal Reserve will go just 25 basis points on Wednesday. Joining us now to talk about the earnings, Tom Forte, the senior research analyst at DA Davidson. Now, Tom, I have some sympathy for you, sir, because the earnings calendar for big tech, the big names in the space of what, 48 hours. Now, Tom, I won't ask you to pick your favourite baby, but if you had to pick one earnings report right now that I could give to you, Tom, what would it be? So if I had to see an uh, earnings report right now, the one that I want to see is Amazon. So I'm curious, the, the term I think that you're going to see this quarter is beaten layoff. 
So to what extent are these big technology companies laying off employees but still outperforming against expectations? So I think that these layoffs put these companies in a position where it's more difficult for them to show uh, better than expected sales and profits because if they had better than expected sales and profits, why are they cutting headcount so significantly? It's a really important question, Tom. So let's ask the question as to why Apple isn't cutting headcount. So Apple will cut headcount. Uh, they'll do it in one of two ways. If you look back to Amazon, uh, between the first quarter and second quarter of last year, they cut about 100,000 heads, mostly at, at the fulfillment center level, uh, when they acknowledged that they were overbuilt for the current level of demand. So Apple could cut by attrition, much like Amazon did. Uh, they've been one of the companies who's been in the news for wanting their employees to return to the headquarters, um, to return to office for a greater period of time. They could assist on that and then have some attrition there. They could also lay off their employees at the uh, retail level. So I do believe that Apple, while they haven't done so yet, uh, like everyone else, they will adjust their headcount for the current level of demand. So far this year, Tom, any kinds of announcements of layoffs has been met usually with a rally in the shares of the company, with this feeling of cost cutting that would allow growth to continue to accelerate. At what point is that not true anymore for the tech complex? So the question is, are they cutting fat or are they cutting muscle? And I think to some degree, a lot of the cuts have been fat. Uh, these companies were bloated in terms of headcount, especially bloated given the low level of demand for e-commerce today and for digital advertising. So the question is, at some point, are they cutting muscle and not fat? Uh, that remains to be seen. But I think that the reason you're seeing the stocks react favorably to the headcount uh, moves is on the expectation that on a near-term basis, it'll re uh, result in higher margins on uh, lower expenses. There are a couple different strains of ideas for the economy within these tech earnings. There's a business side, particularly with cloud computing and the spending that you've seen or not with the disappointing outlook from Microsoft, which potentially we might see repeated by Amazon's uh, AWS. And then there's the consumer side, the consumer still buying and the Apple continuing to be strong on that level. Which prong do you think has the greatest weakness? Are we seeing some of the bigger softening? Yeah, the greater concern, uh, and this pertains to Amazon, from their third quarter results wasn't that their mature e-commerce business was slow growing, it's that their faster higher margin units, cloud computing and advertising, were starting to feel the negative impacts of an increasingly challenged macroeconomic environment. So to the extent we see more signs of that when Amazon reports, I think that's the greater concern given that it's higher revenue, higher margin for Amazon. Let's build on that, Tom. Barron's wrote about this this weekend. I think it's the question to ask for these tech names right now. Are we seeing some of these names face just a little bit of a cyclical test? Or are we seeing some of the structural story that's dominated these names and delivered monster gains over the last five years or so? Are we seeing that structural shift, a change in the underlying trend, Tom, that could be with us for years to come, regardless of the cycle? I'll go with the structural shift. I think that gone are the days where you can get up and expect Amazon, Apple, uh, Alphabet, uh, Meta platforms to outperform against NASDAQ automatically. I think you need to see some company-specific initiatives, or in the case of Alphabet and Meta, a rebound in digital advertising on a strengthening economy for those shares to outperform the NASDAQ even over short periods of time. So I would say it's more structural. I think it's a change in dynamics, and I think it's something that's going to continue to play out over the next 12 months. Uh, Tom, how does that influence your thoughts on how we should be thinking about valuing these companies with that in mind? Well, the challenge for Amazon uh, long-term is in order to maintain its premium multiple, they essentially have to outgrow the contraction in their multiple uh, from an earnings standpoint, which is why you're seeing such a significant shift in focus to services to higher margin efforts for Amazon. But the question for all these companies in big tech is, can they um, outpace the contraction in their multiple, uh, perhaps by having their profits grow at a higher than expected rate and I think it's going to be a challenge across the board. What's going to happen to the unprofitable tech companies? And I think about Snap, for example, as they report earnings tomorrow. Is this going to be the beginning of the end? All right, so two, two things. One, the good news is that uh, you're seeing a bid. So a lot of the companies this year are getting uh, positive performance in their share price, even if you're seeing a pullback in some of their uh, projections for earnings. But for the companies like Snapchat, for companies that are losing money today and maybe don't have a great balance sheet, 
Uh, they're basically in a race against time. Can they get incremental capital? Will the capital markets reopen uh, before they run out of money? And in many instances, it's to be determined. Hey, Tom, this was great. Hopefully we can do this again later this week when these numbers start to drop. Tom Forde there of DA Davidson. What have we got? Apple, Amazon, Meta. Yeah. What else have we got? Alphabet. Alphabet. Just and we've got Snap tomorrow. It's ridiculous a ridiculous lineup. I mean, honestly, can you imagine having to analyze all of these companies as they come out? We asked Tom beforehand, you know, is this is this exciting or a nightmare? And he just said without pause, nightmare. I, I heard that from <laughs> the analyst just, oh. on the banks who will report yeah. it before the long weekend. I can tell you Apple, for those interested, February 2nd, a little bit later this week. Big week coming up. Thursday. Have I said that enough this morning? <laughs> I think you should say it a little bit more. I think Big week coming up. Good. I think now people understand. These are going to be some of the more interesting uh, re reports, earnings reports. And I think that what Tom Forte just said there about the macro play, you get both the business pullback and you get the consumer spending both converging in the likes of Amazon and how much you start to see that weakness. Could that play in a bigger play in a, in a bigger way? You know, could that be a sort of economic data point in its own right? Is TK coming back tomorrow? I, so I hear, and you know, this is going to be the first time in a couple of weeks that we've all been together. I think people think we are on a boycott of being together. A boycott together. of what? Of being, of being together. together? Yeah, Why and that's they not true. That? I don't know. I've been getting a lot of messages. What are they saying? You know, what's going on? Why are the what's, three of you never together? What's, yeah, maybe what's the conspiracy theory? Somebody was like, the honeymoon period is over. There, there was a honeymoon? <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Like, at what point did someone think this was a honeymoon? But uh, on the other hand, yeah, no, he's just um, off today, and uh, he'll be back tomorrow, supposedly, for the uh, snap earnings. That's really his oh, key. That's exactly it's what he's point. coming in for. Yeah, he's he loves do, that. He's going to do that. some I, serious. I can picture his face. Yeah, do, he's sure. going to be all about that. And Apple, he's going to be you know, holding up his iPhone the entire day. Well, that's usually what he does when we cover the name. Companies adapt, didn't you know? They also adjust. They adjust and they adapt. <laughs> so we hear. Tom's line on corporate America. I mean, it's true, though. In the next hour, we'll catch up with George Concarvis of MUFG, Kristen Biddley of Citigroup, and Jim Bianco of Bianco Research, looking ahead to a monster week of earnings, of central bank decisions, and of economic data as well. We've asked the question through this morning, the most important one for Fed Chair Jay Powell, the easing of financial conditions over the last few months. Is it warranted or unwarranted? And once you've got the response to that question... How do you respond as a market participant? Do you ignore Chairman Powell and focus on the rate cuts that perhaps you're pricing? We've had that question asked repeatedly through this morning. And when I ask the question, are you focused on the data or Chairman Powell, what's the response we're getting? Data. The data. Down. And what does that tell you about how they're going to respond to Chairman Powell on Wednesday? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, a viewer writes in, Chat GPT says Bloomberg morning guests are at odds, citing egos. Is that so right? that's what Chat GPT <laughs> says. Uh, you know, we will see. But data has ruled out. I mean, I'm tempted to ask. Dare I ask who you think's got the biggest ego on this line? <laughs> With what, guests? No, or just, you the show? Just in general. In on general? This show. On this show, just in general. <laughs> How would you rank them? Wow, God, look at those markets. Look They're at really them. going I gotta, down. I gotta go. I gotta go. <laughs>
And if they're slowing down to a pace of 25, it's hard to, I think, push back too strongly. So I, I mean, I think that they will reinforce their message and repeat their message. But I think it's hard to be hawkish and strong when you just slow down again. So the policy action suggests they're more comfortable with the outlook. They're more comfortable with where they are pushing back. And at that point, by saying, no, 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 we're going to be super hawkish, it's hard to do that. So I remember uh, a long six months ago when people were really talking about the potential pain, including Jay Powell, mm -hmm. uh, to markets, to the economy, if you have both rate hikes as well as a balance sheet runoff. We're talking about rate hikes and how perhaps we're at the penultimate peak of them or whatever you want to call it, uh, if you're Stephen Major over H H HSBC. But no one's talking about the balance sheet anymore. Mm -hmm. Should we be? I think we're going to get to that point. So if the Fed is in a higher for longer phase, right, and and they're saying, okay, markets expect more rapid disinflation, they're looking for cuts, fine. It's a different view of the outlook. We think inflation is going to be stickier. Uh, and you heard uh, Governor Waller say, hey, we should consider continuing to run the balance sheet off even as we cut rates, right? I, I don't think that would be consensus. Like we and others, I think, are saying if the Fed eventually cuts rates, they probably stop QT at the same time. And I think Waller kind of threw out there for the, for the first time, you know, maybe not. Maybe we run the balance sheet off for longer. So you get more combined tightness out of the funds rate and the balance sheet. Have we seen it yet, the tightening from that particular effort? Yes. I mean, the markets build all of that in advance, right? I think if, if you're a stock person versus a flow person, you think, well, how much total cumulative runoff of the balance sheet are we going to have? Therefore, how much our, our market's going to have to absorb in Treasury debt, this would be a way of saying, hey, maybe you didn't think the balance sheet was going to run off as much as you thought, right? So you might get re, uh, you know, you reevaluate your expectation of just how much Treasury debt the market's going to have to reabsorb. Another way of asking this is, when do we start to see the peak influence of the tightening cycle in economic data? Have we already started to see most of it or a material amount of it, or will we only see it six months from now? I think we're literally just getting to the point where we're seeing it. I think the Historically, and the, the modeling would tell you it takes at least 12, if not 18, maybe even up to 24 months to see the cumulative effects of tightening come through. So conditions started to tighten in March and April of last year. We're in the first quarter again. So I think it's really in, still in front of us. So I think there's, there's more to come. And I think that's why most of our growth expectations for 2023, soft landing versus hard landing, are still weaker than they were in 22. When it comes to the labor market, we get mm -hmm. the labor market report, the non-farm payrolls on Friday. What do we have to see in order to continue with this feeling that the Fed is making progress? And I put progress in quotes because nobody wants to see progress as people losing right. their jobs. Right. But really uh, making some inroads in terms of softening the economy enough to bring inflation down. I mean, I think the target here from the Fed's perspective is is monthly job gains 70 to 100,000 or less. So what I think you would need to see Friday is we're on a path to that and to get there in the next, say, three to six months. Um, we're likely to get some payback from the California strike this week. We, we think the headline will be around 225, so similar to what we saw last month. I'm not quite convinced that we'll get that message this Friday. Um, but that, that, I think, is the goal. We need to know that things are decelerating and softening, not rapidly rolling over. But you probably, you know, 70, 80,000 a month is probably where the Fed is, is targeting. OK, so if we don't see that, what's the risk? What's the response uh, from the Fed? The, well, the risk is you keep leaking 25 basis point hikes as the labor market doesn't slow down. So if the, if, the, if the data continues to moderate and inflation continues to fall, that's your hike and pause in March scenario. But the stronger the labor market stays, the more cautious they will be about inflation and the more they're likely to stay on hold and those cuts the market is looking for in the second half of the year don't materialize. When we talk about the employment market, it feels like it's segmented mm -hmm. in many different ways. You have uh, perhaps the people who work on the ground in jobs that were not fillable during the pandemic. I think about service sector. I think about uh, you know some of the fulfillment centers. And a lot of people have not been laid off, even as companies struggle, simply because they're worried about not getting being able to rehire them. How much is this a structural change that means a more fully employed base, even in a negative uh, economic outlook. So I think that's right. I think most of us have that in, in our forecast. We certainly do. And, and, and so like what I'll say from a foreseeable horizon, two to three years out, maybe even four years out, I think this condition 
persist. So I think that's absolutely right. It's why we look for a tick lower in hours worked on Friday, not necessarily a material weakening in, in hiring, right? So you'd, you'd reduce temporary hires first. You'd slow down hours, right? So if you were labor hoarding, those are the things that you would do first, right, to manage your, your labor input. We think we'll see more of that on Friday. So do you think that there's a structural uh, obstacle to getting inflation back to 2 percent that is underappreciated by people who are seeing the deceleration and kind of cheering that on? Yeah, the immaculate disinflation story that you mentioned would require, I think, some of this going away or labor supply picking up, right? So I, I do think the, the wage story and the services story, which is what the Fed's been focusing on, is where persistence to inflation would come from. So yes, goods prices are falling and that's great. And we've all been expecting and hoping for that. And that's what's bringing, that's what's really bringing headline lower. But to get it all the way back down to the Fed's comfort zone, you know, we'll see. It's That's less clear at this point. We're speaking with Michael Gapin of Bank of America Securities at a time when a lot of people think that this is an inflection point. We have a host of economic data. We have FOMC, ECB, and Bank of England decisions. And we also have China the first uh, week after the Lunar New Year, how, what this reopening actually looks like. From your vantage point, where will we see the reopening? Will it be more in terms of the increase in demand from Chinese consumers or more in terms of the demand for commodities pushing up prices and causing uh, some more inflation? I mean, certainly from my purview and what I look for in terms of how it would affect the U.S. outlook, it, it's the latter. Um, because, as we all know, energy prices transmit pretty quickly into gasoline prices and to consumer balance sheets. So if, if a China reopening comes forcefully and it pushes commodity prices higher, that could actually be, you know, a material drag on the consumer. We saw that in the first half of last year. We got tailwinds in the in the second half of, of last year from that. So I, I think it's less important about a global growth narrative from from my mind than than what happens to commodity prices. I'm looking right now at gasoline prices three uh, three dollars and fifty cents on average for a gallon from a low uh, back in December of about three dollars a mm -hmm. gallon. How much do you watch this in terms of what that does to consumer spending? It's one of the most critical things we watch. So the discretionary versus non-discretionary component. Last year, when gasoline prices and food prices were surging, we saw the rest of the consumer uh, consumption bundle take a take a step back. So for me, it's it's very important, right? So obviously, we were at about five dollars a gallon. It fell all the way back to kind of March 2020 pre-Russia invasion Ukraine levels, right? So that was a tailwind for the consumer for a lot of the second half of last year. We're not thinking that continues, right? We've probably normalized. The The question is, do we go from 350 to four or do we kind of bounce around at, at three and a half? What would that look like in terms of uh, both recession, inflation, and the Fed's actions? Well, it would, it would mean the decline in the rate of decline in headline inflation would start to slow. Base effects would, would be less favorable in, in that regard. Um, and then, yes, it would take the edge off of consumption on the margin. We're seeing consumption moderate, right? Most of us have that baked into our forecasts. And we're, and we're kind of saying, hey, what, we're ta what are tailwinds and have been tailwinds to the consumer should start turning into headwinds. And so that would be a headwind story. On the flip side, one of the difficult aspects of getting your head around this particular market is that there are different segments that are moving in this economy at completely different uh, <laughs> different paces. And I think about housing. We already saw a re real deceleration there, and now we're starting to see it kind of even out in terms of the negative and the positive news. Is this a turn, or is this just basically a pause before housing continues to deteriorate? I would, I mean, I would say I think we've probably had the peak deterioration. I'm not ready to say I think housing makes the, the turn just yet. Um, mortgage rates are still pretty high, and home prices have come down a little, but not a lot. I still think the affordability shock is there. So, you know, maybe housing is a little less frozen than, than it was a couple of months ago, but I'm not ready to say housing is, is, is on the turn upward. So certainly I, I expect it to turn up before the broader economy does. I'm just not sure we're there in Q1. Do you think that the Fed could actually end up getting uh, north of five and a quarter percent, even with everything that's baked into markets where people are basically not even believing the Fed will get to five percent? Yes, because I think it's the, if you look at the labor market alone, I think it's easy to conclude you're going to get above five to five and a quarter, which is what we think the terminal will be. On the other side, 
the manufacturing data is slowing. Industrial production has fallen for two months in a row. So the, the slowdown is broadening beyond housing into the goods sector. Inflation's coming down. Again, that's your hike in March and pause story. But if you look at the labor markets alone, yes, I think it's easy to conclude there's still upside risk to the, to the Fed's path. Michael Gapin, thank you so much for being with us. Michael Gapin of thank Bank you. of America Securities. Interesting uh, about the jobs report, the non-farm payrolls, it having to be below 100,000, potentially even 70,000 for a number of months in a row. The expectation for this month from Bank of America, north of 220,000. So perhaps uh, a bit of distance between what the Fed would like to see, not on a human level, but on an economic level versus what's real on the ground. Coming up, Michael O'Rourke, chief market strategist at Jones Trading, as we try to get our heads around how long this tech-driven rally can continue in the face of a Fed that may push back pretty aggressively on Wednesday. Right now, we are seeing a bit of softening down about three, ten, three quarters of a percent on the S&P. Uh, we're looking at 40, 48. We've got yields in the 10-year up five basis points to 3.55 percent. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden will meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy Wednesday to discuss raising the debt ceiling and avoiding a U.S. default. Republicans want a deal that includes government spending cuts. The president has refused to negotiate over the debt limit. In Ukraine, authorities say a Russian missile hit a residential building in Kharkiv, the country's second largest city. At least one person was killed, three wounded. Two weeks ago, a Russian missile hit an apartment building in the city of Dnipro, killing 45 people. In Malaysia, Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim demanded that Goldman Sachs honor its multi-billion dollar settlement with the government for its role in the 1MDB scandal. Anwar spoke to Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin in her first interview with international media since becoming Prime Minister. I think Goldman Sachs should come out clean. And, and, and deal with Malaysia. And don't, don't think that you can, you know, dismiss this as something um, uh, small that you can just use your strength to uh, dictate your terms. Goldman has said that if it can't reach an agreement with Malaysia on the dispute, it will be settled by arbitration. Well, Ford is responding to Tesla's recent price cuts. The automaker is slashing the price of its electric Mustang Mach-E by an average of $4,500. That discount comes on a model that Ford already described as unprofitable. Analysts predict the pace of growth for electric vehicles will slow this year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think there's so many signs that the economy is likely to head into recession, but it's going to take a while. And that's been the hallmark of this whole cycle. Every stage has taken longer and gone farther than you expect. We think this rally could last us through mid-year. That was Steve Chiverone, head of multi-asset solutions at Federated Hermes, really reflecting what a lot of people have been saying, the new consensus, perhaps, that this strength can last for longer than many people had expected, that the dip and rip is now rip and dip, or maybe just a sustained rally uh, into the end of the year before perhaps some of the uh, ongoing tightening really takes full effect. We're seeing uh, markets a little bit softer after an incredible rally led by the tech names, and that really has stood out to me. And today you are we're seeing a disproportionate sell-off in the Nasdaq. The S&P down eight tenths of a percent now, 40 of 50, and this really does come on the heels of perhaps a little bit of an increase in yields, but otherwise stability, 3.55 percent for the 10-year, which really raises a question of how much there is a direct correlation between bond yields and tech stocks. That when bond yields go down, tech stocks rally, and vice versa. Michael O'Rourke, chief market strategist at Jones Trading, joining us now, and I want to start there after an incredible rally led by the those tech names that a lot of people had really discounted or written off by the end of last year. How much is this a direct correlation of yields on bonds going lower? I think we're seeing a lot of model-driven trading that that is setting up that trade. When you know when bond yields drop, they buy technology shares. 
Um, you get into those, you know, those long dated growth names. But uh, like I said, I think it's more mechanical. I think it's systematic. I, and I think it's so I don't think it's something that's going to be sustainable because obviously, you know, when you look at earnings season, how earnings have played out, um, the fundamental story is not there. I think we entered 2023 with a lot of pent up demand among uh, stock investors and in that they, they, they were well behaved in 2022, knowing the environment was a little bit, a little bit gloomy. So they wanted to put money to work and they've done it thus far early in 2023. But you're looking at seven mega cap names driving 50% of the S&P 500 gain year to date. And that's including Microsoft who basically had a disappointing earnings call. So, um, I, like I said, I, I think it's, it's still happening, but I don't think it's sustainable. Let's dig into uh, the earnings side of things. You said so far we really haven't seen incredible earnings. What, how important are the earnings that we're going to see later this week? Meta on Wednesday, Apple, Amazon, uh, and Alphabet all coming out on Thursday. Yeah, I, I'm calling it AAA Thursday. Uh, you're talking about three mega cap names. That represent about 12 to 13 percent of the S&P 500. They do 1.2 trillion in revenues. So when you look at Amazon, you know Google or Alphabet, and um, and Apple, it, it's just that's going to be a big day. And I think that's going to set the tone for earnings season. Um, while we've you know the markets responded well even amidst bad news uh, on the earnings front, I think that's going to set the tone going forward. And again, it's, it's really hard to sit there and say anyone's going to have a great outlook because there's still so much uncertainty as to how things are going to play out in 2023. What concerns you more, the consumer side of the tech picture or the macro picture, the idea of, of businesses and how much they're investing in the cloud, in other kinds of basic infrastructure? Well, I, I think a lot of what we saw coming out of the pandemic was, I, I think, very similar to the 1999-2000 technology bubble. You had a lot of investment into uh, these high growth areas, these new areas that people didn't realize would, you know, would commercialize pretty quickly. And I think that overspend and that overbuild is obviously we've seen a lot of that unwind in 2022. I think that's more, I think we're going to see more of that. And I think when you look at Intel's numbers last week, you're seeing some of that weakness uh, emerge among the bigger names. And I think that's going to be a problem going forward. But also, so you're looking at, you know, as of last week when we got the PCE report, this is the first time since 2019, and there was only a small brief period, uh, that we had a, a neutral Fed funds rate where we've had a negative Fed funds rate, a real Fed funds rate, negative real Fed funds rate most of the time, you know, since 2000, early 2008. So we getting to the point where we're going to have a positive real Fed funds rate, which is actual real tightening emerging in the economy for the first time in a long time. And that should be a headwind for the market. So if we do get uh, perhaps some hawkish discussion from Fed Chair Jay Powell on Wednesday, perhaps pushing back against some of the rally that we've seen, will markets take notice? Will they listen? Will they actually sell off? And uh, will you see a tightening in financial conditions? Well, you're 100 percent right. That's a big question. But it's funny, as of you know Friday's close, the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index is at its lowest level since Jay Powell gave his Jackson Hole speech back in August. So we've had, obviously, at least 100 basis points of Fed funds increases. I think the Fed's balance sheet's shrunk by 4 percent since then. But we're not seeing financial conditions tighten. So we get a 25 basis point rate hike Wednesday. That will put us in a positive real, real Fed funds rate environment. But the question is, how much more will the Fed need to do? And I think when you start seeing the markets react to the hawkishness of the Fed in a meaningful way, that will give them room to be a little more cautious or, or be a little more tentative with rate hikes. But while the market continues to ignore um, you know, policy and the direction we're heading, I think you're going to see them err on the side of hawkishness rather than just let markets continue to, uh, you know, ignore the fundamentals, basically. Talking about the fundamentals, a lot of people heading into 2023 were talking about margin compression and the likelihood that companies would have to pare back some of the price gains or the price increases in order to cater to consumers that were struggling a bit more. We just got this headline. Lisa Mateo was talking about it. Ford cutting the price of its electric Mustang models in response to Tesla and their price cuts. Their price cuts, some people had speculated, really to try to corner a market. How much are you looking at this type of mini price war, mini price cutting uh, kinds of battles that really shrink margins more than anything else in the earnings? Well, I mean, it, it, that's that's an incredible headline because obviously the Tesla price cuts started at the end of last year to obviously firm up their fourth quarter. Tesla's shares traded, I think it was around 130 
five hundred and six dollars a couple of weeks ago. You know, they, they went out last week at 179, I believe. So we've had a 70% rally in Tesla shares in three weeks. And then you have this Ford headline today where you have a price war going on. I mean, price wars are not good for, you know, they're not good for business, they're not good for margins. Um, obviously, that type of competition should not be good for share prices. But what we've seen over the past two to three weeks is the market, because financial conditions remain easy, has ignored those fundamental developments that have been going on for at least a month now. Well, yeah, I want to just point out, though, Ford uh, shares in pre-market trading down about two and a half percent. Tesla shares now up after being down earlier in the day by about a percent, up about four tenths of a percent, perhaps being seen as the winner in this particular war as Ford uh, capitulates on the price cutting side. On a larger scale, though, we're going to be getting auto manufacturing and auto sales numbers this week. Uh, and how much is that really important to see what the demand is like, how strong that consumer really is? Yeah, I, I think I think we're all, you know, everyone's girding for, uh, you know, is, is concerned about a, a potential recession out there. We haven't seen the slowdown in jobs. So we have seen some softer economic data. Um, the interesting thing is this whole situation seems to be taking much longer to play out than investors realize. So I, I think that's another aspect of where, when you look at where the stock market is, like, you know, we hit four decade highs in inflation and, you know, we were only just getting back to a neutral policy rate. You know, these things don't reverse overnight. So I think we'll keep an eye on the consumer because obviously that, that's a key, the key component of the economy. But I also don't think it's falling out of bed right away. And I, that, again, that just reinforces the Fed's higher for longer message, which is something that this market hasn't been accustomed to for the past 15 years. So just real quick here, what would be your a top trading recommendation in given what we've seen so far in 2023? Oh, I, I think investors should take, like, you, you've been given this rally that was, I, I call it basically unearned. Uh, I think you should take process, profits here and be a little more defensive. I still like sectors like the financials, and I think the banks are in good shape. Um, but I think there's still, uh, you know, there's a long way to go here uh, to, for 2023 to play out, and it's not going to be straight up the way the first three weeks have been. Long European banks? <laughs> Um, I like U.S. banks more, but it, obviously everyone's there's a big trade going on with people favoring Europe over the U.S. right now, um, and that's I think that has to do with you know um, the valuation difference that's going on there, and obviously there was a bit of a hope that the e, well the ECB will you know interest rates there will peak at a lower level, but um, I prefer the U.S. banks, but again I still would just be cautious overall. Michael O'Rourke of Jones Trading, thank you so much for being with us. I was mentioning uh, European banks. Barclays analysts came out uh, with a long, potentially, uh, for those banks. So right now, we are seeing shares uh, move lower more broadly. Interesting headline that we were talking about with Ford kind of joining in with some of the uh, price cuts that we have seen. We're not seeing those price cuts in the airline space. Coming up, we do have tomorrow on Bloomberg Television what we were talking about, an exclusive interview with Dave Calhoun, Boeing president and chief executive officer. Today, there was news out of that company. They expect travel to really reach pre-COVID levels due to the reopening in China. We will build on that in that interview tomorrow. From New York, this is Bloomberg.